My dick is sweet. Ugh, mine needs a lot of work. Well, we both learned something. Yeah, that's why we goldfish. All right, draw seven new ones and back in the tank. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai, Rachel. I have to admit, it's freaking me out a little bit to sit on this side of the table. I'm sorry. We, <laughs> for for technical, technical reasons, you have to bear it. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and make do. Sorry, everybody out there. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've never seen this side of Josh. He's a whole new host. <laughs> Josh has a left cheek. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we are talking about a tool that should be in every Magic player's toolbox. It's gold fishing. Yep. Playtesting. Play solitaire. Yeah. yeah. All of those work. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't know why it was called goldfishing until you told me. Yeah, I have, I had definitely looked it up <laughs> I because like, I went through a long period of my of my magic career where I called it fish bowling. Fish bowling. Because <laughs> I had no idea, and then someone was like, "It's goldfish." <laughs> like that makes as much sense. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna say neither one makes any sense. So <laughs> yeah, it's because you're playing against an opponent that's just a nothing opponent. Like it's a, yeah, a goldfish like a, yeah. would be really bad at Magic the Gathering, and they wouldn't <laughs> take game actions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to break down how to goldfish, uh, how to do it well, and we're going to walk through uh, a number of goldfishing scenarios to kind of show you what we think about when we when we goldfish our decks. Um, and it'll teach you a lot about your deck and how to play and how to build. It's I really do fun. think it's probably one of the most important things, if you know how to do it, that will improve your decks the first time that you actually play them in real games. Mm. Yeah. Not to toot my own horn, but I do believe I'm very good at goldfishing, and that's because of game nights. We learned really early on, like, the first time we're probably going to play this deck is going to be on camera, mm -hmm. and we want it to look really good, so we would just obsessively goldfish the, you know, the couple yeah. of days before to make sure the deck would actually work and do its thing, because we're often building new decks for game nights with sets that weren't out yet. EHREC doesn't exist, or it existed, but it doesn't know the cards we're playing with, mm -hmm. and... Yeah, so that's why version ones of our decks tend to look like, you know, version mm -hmm. twos or threes of most people's decks because we didn't have the luxury of playtesting them in real games a lot of times first. Yeah, they, uh, they better work on camera because it's a little bit of pressure. Uh, before we get into goldfishing, of course, we're going to talk about our sponsors. Of course, if you need to pick up any of the magic cards that you need for your deck, go to cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom has a huge selection of magic cards, and in all of the versions and all of the conditions that you're looking for for your decks, we're commander players, we're picky about printing, we're picky about condition. When you shop at Card Kingdom, you know that they have the professionalism and the selection to get you the cards that you're looking for. Plus, when you're goldfishing, you learn a lot about your decks. Yeah. You need, you know that cards need to come out. New cards want to come in. And if you get to goldfish, especially digitally, you can buy all of those cards with the knowledge that they work well in your deck. And you can pick up any of those cards from Card Kingdom, the brand that we trust when we build our decks. Yeah, for sure. Goldfishing will teach you a lot about what you want, and you mm -hmm. want to order the new cards that you now know you need on Card Kingdom. And of course, once you get them, you want to keep them in pristine condition. Ultra Pro is the game accessories brand that we trust our own collections to here at the Command Zone. If you go to ultrapro.com slash command, you can find all kinds of cool deck boxes, sleeves, play mats. They've got wall scrolls. They've got dice. They basically have everything you need to play the game of Magic, but not, not just to play. To make sure that everything looks cool, looks mm -hmm. sharp, looks snappy, and also that all of your game pieces stay protected. So ultrapro.com slash command. Another big perk of just going to their website, uh, you know, often once a week or so I like to check, is they have tons of discounts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you sign up for their newsletter, then they'll let you know when those discounts happen, but also just checking the site, you'll often come across just crazy, you know, reductions in price for stuff. So if you're looking for binders and things of that nature, you know, which we all need from time to time, ultrapro.com slash command, the place to go. I went on there recently for a flash sale, and they had the keyword dice back in stock. And those things are incredible, yep. and they're low stock right now. So get them before they run out. Yeah, those things go fast. I love them. <laughs> they're really, really helpful. 
and finally, the, you can support us directly by going to patreon.com slash command zone. Our patrons get access to a ton of cool perks, including extra turns and game nights a day early without ads. You get to watch it all directly, no spoilers for you, and you can discuss the game with us in our patron-exclusive Discord. We're all in there. Uh, you can ask us questions in the Ask the Host channel, or you can go to the latest episode channel and discuss episodes that come out for the podcast or games. It's a really fun way to kind of recap what's been going on on our channel. Uh, and finally, we shout out one lucky patron every single podcast episode, and this one is dedicated, dedicated to Casey, Casey Comiskey. Comiskey. Casey, you rock. All right. Uh, all right. Main topic here, the importance of playtesting or goldfishing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's let's just explain because I think a lot yeah. of people don't know what goldfishing is. Yeah. I And it's it's a lot. It's very simple. So once you hear it, you're like, yeah, I get it. But just for, for people who are new and who haven't played this, uh, done this at all, goldfishing is just running through the first few turns of your deck with no opponent, with a goldfish opponent. Solitaring your deck, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So you draw for turn, you play your lands, you cast your spells, and you just sort of see how it feels. Yeah. It's a big thing to kind of learn. Is your deck feel smooth? You mm -hmm. know, oh, oh, there's a lot to learn, which we're going to go over in a second here, but it really is, at its base, a very simple concept. Mm -hmm. Play your deck as if you've got an opponent who's doing nothing that matters to you, really. Yeah. Some basic things is, like, usually we mulligan to a good seven. Yep. Keeping, like, you keep an idea of, of how many times you've mulliganed. Obvi obviously, if you have to mulligan a lot, that's something that you need to keep uh, track of. And then I usually play between five and seven turns. Yeah, I think that's a good... Um, it's more of a feel thing, and a lot of this mm -hmm. is more art than science, but I believe, like, somewhere between five and seven turns. Uh, it's d It becomes less useful the later you go into the game because you you do know in a real game things will have happened to change your sequencing to affect your board and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but what you're really trying to do is like, did I smoothly get to turn five or seven? And does the road ahead look pretty smooth? Yeah. You know, do I know what my plan is? Or did it feel herky-jerky? Did it feel like I was inefficient? Did I feel like my plan didn't get online? You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I usually play until I feel like I have an engine online. Until I'm like, okay, we have, we have my commanders in play. I have this thing going and this is happening. Great. Now we'll go again. Uh, because that'll tell you how well your deck is working. And if you get to turn seven and that hasn't happened, you're like, okay, well, something has gone wrong. Um, yeah, these days it feels like by around turn five. You really you need really to have something do, going on. Yeah, your wheels need to be churning. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not an engine that's completely repeatable, but you just know like the plan for my deck is kind of is going. It's like, mm -hmm. like this is going to work. Right. And of course, there'll be interaction and stuff later in the game. But the interesting thing about goldfishing is it's not really about that. You learn a lot of other things from goldfishing that isn't necessarily if your deck stands up well to interaction. That's something that you learn in games when you have actual opponents in your playgroup. Yeah, that's a question people ask a lot when you talk about playtesting and goldfishing is like, well, how do you, you know, you know, during a real game, your opponents might remove stuff or they might have stuff that you need to remove or they might board wipe or you mm -hmm. might need to board wipe. How do you synthesize those moments and the question and the answer is kind of you don't really yeah that's like like rachel said you're that's not a thing that goldfishing is really there to teach you and you just say like that is more of a thing that you kind of have to trust the rubrics that are out there you know generally we like to say these days you know you want 10 to 14 maybe single target interaction mm -hmm. spells and you want you know two to three board wipes and those numbers are always changing right like there's been a lot of discussion online lately that you want more board wipes these days because it's so much ward and maybe that's true but mm -hmm. whatever it is you kind of have to trust like okay I know I want 10 of this and four of that and I'm going to keep to those numbers even though during goldfishing those cards won't feel great because I don't have uses for them because my opponents are not there. Right. But that's a moment where you just, I trust those numbers for that stuff. I'm not going to mess with that part right. of the deck. Yeah. I trust that I'm going to need a board wipe at some point. Yeah. It feels dead now. It won't be dead later. Exactly. Uh, but there is a lot of things that you can learn from goldfishing without any opponents. And it's about sort of the nuts and bolts of your deck. How does the meat of your deck work? 
Uh, and it's not like it's not about finding out if your deck is good or if it can win, really. Yeah, I think can win is a question you can sort of answer. But yeah. like you said, we're going to stop before we would actually win. Mm -hmm. We don't play all the way till like, and then I infinite combo and definitely would have won here. Yeah. You look down the road at a certain point and say, you know, do I see a pretty easy path if I didn't get interrupted to victory from here? And, you know, does it feel like I'd be able to figure that out? That's fine. I'm going to stop now. But I like what you said at the start, which... Does my deck work? Does it do the thing? Whatever mm -hmm. the concept of your deck was, like, you know, at the beginning when you started to build it, mm -hmm. like, what it wanted to do. It's going to make a lot of tokens, and then I'm going to attack f with, you know, and overrun my opponents. Mm -hmm. So does it feel like your deck is accomplishing that task within the five to seven turns? Like, it's getting to the point where it's like, yeah, I've made a lot of tokens, and yes, I have pump spells available to me. Mm -hmm. Those are the pieces that I need, and I got there within that amount of time, and it feels like, you know, that... It was a reasonably efficient to get mm. there. It felt smooth. That tells you, like, oh, my, the concept for my deck feels like mm. it, it does work. And if it doesn't, you're like, okay, I need to tweak things so that I can accomplish those goals. And that's one great thing about goal fishing, I think, is, like, during deck building, you get distracted, right? My original concept was deck was make a lot of tokens and pump them. Yeah, but, but if that, I have a lot of tokens, I also want, like, stuff that when the tokens die, do they trigger? Exactly, or I want to be able to sacrifice them to get this kind of stuff, or whatever. And then you play the deck, and you realize, I put so much of that other stuff in that now it won't even accomplish the main goal. Mm. Uh, all I have is payoffs, and I'm not actually making enough tokens. And you learn, like, oh, I got to kill some of these payoffs so that I can accomplish step number one, which is get a lot of tokens. Get a lot of tokens. Yeah, and so... That Yeah, that's one of the main things you're looking for with gold fishing, and that's just one example. If you're Aristocrats deck, it's the opposite. I want to make a lot of tokens, but I don't need pump spells. I need mm -hmm. ways to sack them, and sometimes you find, like, it's really hard to sack these creatures. I'm not getting that value out of them. Yeah. Or you find the other thing. I, gotta, I, I just overestimate the number of sack outlets I need. I find myself often having ways to sack creatures and not enough creatures to sack, you know. I found balance is, uh, like, the balance of the synergistic elements in your deck is one of the biggest things you can learn from gold fishing because you know that when you're building this, you're like, I, I know I'm going to need sack outlets, I know I'm going to need payoffs, I know I'm going to need ways to make creatures. But it's really hard to know how many of each thing that you need for this style of deck. You're like, maybe I only need you know, four or five sack outlets because I only need them for one big turn. Yep. Or maybe you want things to be dying on turn two and you need, like, 10 sack outlets to make sure that that is happening. So the balance is going to be a little different, no matter like however you're building the deck, whether it's Aristocrats or Spellslinger. Like I, you build a Spellslinger deck and you find out your deck is full of permanents and you're like, I just don't have enough cantrips or I don't have enough spells that do anything. Yeah, I can't uh, string together enough things. I think another thing yeah. with a lot of decks is you find just your mana needs uh, mm -hmm. outweigh what you can, you know, you build the deck and you've got all the cards that you want, but you're in order to pull it off, like I have the right cards, but I can't do it all. Mm -hmm. And then you have to sort of retool, you know, the deck in a way that like I need ways to get an explosive amount of mana or up the amount of mana I have because the thing I want to pull off requires me, you know, to have mm -hmm. 12 mana to do it. And if I can't accomplish that within, you know, seven or eight turns, like mm -hmm. it probably won't happen. And this is all stuff that you can learn, obviously, from playing games, but when you like playing games, you're already there. Your deck, you want your deck to perform. You're playing against other people. So this, if you goldfish early, this gives you all of this information beforehand. So when you play a game, you have already thought about some of these problems. Well, it also helps with like gameplay choices, like mulliganing. Oh yeah. Well, I, I want to say that game playing with real opponents is actually very slow way to get data, and mm -hmm. it skews so much that you can goldfish a hundred times in you know an hour, maybe. Mm -hmm. Playing 100 games of Commander will take you months. Yeah. And you'd have to play the same deck over and over. And your data for, especially early on, might be skewed. Maybe you got targeted earlier that game. Maybe they just happen to have a nut draw. Maybe they, and, and so you need a large amount of data set to really come to any sort of conclusions, whereas Goldfish allows you to pinpoint certain things, and you can't learn everything, but the things you can learn get a lot of data really quickly to mm -hmm. kind of make decisions about changing your deck before you enter the actual arena mm -hmm. and do stuff like that. So, yeah, I think... Playing games to learn how to build your deck is a very inefficient way right. to do it. It can teach you things that goldfishing can't, but goldfishing is way better at certain things. Like uh, another thing we haven't mentioned yet, but I think one of the main things I learned through goldfishing is just card velocity. Mm -hmm. So often it's just like, oh, I'm down to one or two cards a lot when I'm playing this. I get to turn five or seven, and yes, my plan's online, but I got a card. I got one card. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't feel good because I don't have a lot of options. And it also doesn't feel like my deck will be consistent enough to be able to get that engine going if I'm like bare, by the skin of my teeth making it there. Like mm -hmm. you want to get there and you're like, yeah, and I have five or six other things I could have been doing. So I think card velocity is like a really big thing to learn.
Yeah, I mean, and that, I think that comes up in proof of concept. Like, there's some decks where you're like, I've got my 10 pieces of card draw, it's fine. And then you play other decks and you're like, I need like 20 pieces of card draw. I am dumping my hand. Yeah. Like a Dragon's Approach deck. We, you and I both have a Dragon's Approach yeah. deck. Half the deck is Dragon's Approach. The other half is card draw because yeah. you just need to draw because all the like cards. The, you find when you approach. goldfish it, the only thing I want to do is draw a Dragon's Approach or draw cards to draw more Dragon's Approach. That's, that's it. That's all I really that's, care about. I don't need anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like what you said there as your second point, mm -hmm. which was it's not just about deck building. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the ingredients that I'm putting in here and yeah. th the relative balance. That's a really important piece that I think you can learn. But I think the part, and I think all magic content suffers from this because it's just easier to talk about deck building than it is to talk about playing mm -hmm. the decks and actually piloting. But gold fishing is really, really good at teaching you also how to play your deck and teaching you... Things like what is the proper sequence? What do I want? What kind of effects do I want to play before others? Am I the deck that wants to get my commander out first and then play pieces that pay off what my commander is doing, or do I need to play the pieces and then play my commander to take advantage of the setup? Or you know, other things that can be taught are like what is the best card in my deck? What is mm. the best type of card in my deck? What do I want to go look for if I have a tutor and I don't need a specific answer for something? Mm. Like, yeah, when I, we, uh, you know, you, you play with new players and this is not just new players, but just players with a new deck. And a lot of times, what, that's just that classic thing where they're like, I'm playing the deck for the first time, which we all forgive this. This is totally fine. Yeah. But, you know, they're looking for the deck with a tutor and they're not sure what to get and you're everybody is watching that person read every card in their deck to try and figure out what the card they want to get here is. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you goldfish a lot, you usually know, like, if everything else is equal, Skull Clamp is what I'm getting. Right. Like, I just know that. And so I'm going to grab Skull Clamp, and I'm going to take a quick look, see if anything's better than Skull Clamp right now. It's not Skull Clamp. Yeah. And that, you know, by the way, if Skull Clamp's in your deck, it probably it's is. It's probably the best one. It's probably the one it's you're really getting. Good. Yeah. He's going to draw you all the other cards you need. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> and that's what you, but, yeah. but in different decks, that answer is different. And knowing that answer is really important to, not, you know, I, I see it as like a nice thing I can do for the players I'm going to play against too. Mm -hmm. It's like I can be prepared going into the game, mostly knowing how I want to play my deck. So I don't spend an abnormal amount of time thinking. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you, the, sometimes you use tutors to find answers, but then you're looking for a very specific thing. So all of that is answered for you. If, if you're just looking for an engine, piece then you should be able to know that Wh at what point like when i have this card my deck pops off yep so you go find that card and you can learn that in gold fishing or you might know like oh i had to sacrifice or i had to sacrifice i had to you know cut down a little on my sacrifice outlets mm -hmm. to make this other part work but when i have a sacrifice outlet it's really good so when i tutor i'm gonna go to get a sacrifice outlet because mm -hmm. i know it's just a little harder to find those in my deck but when i have one it's a, it is an important piece so you just those are just things you know about your deck and that's why school clamp is so good because yeah. it is a sacrifice outlet too yeah <laughs> it does two things uh i think we're talking about like the cards that are really good in tutoring but that also gives you a lot of information on how to mulligan mm -hmm. there's certain there's certain decks that you're like i just need a mana dork on one or two I just have to have one or I'm going to be too slow. So you And you need to learn that because when you don't have one, when you're goldfishing, your deck feels slow. You know that, like, if, if I'm playing Rakdos, Lord of Riots, I know I need some way to deal damage to my opponents and yep. I need it to be cheaper than Rakdos. Yep. So if that's not in my opening hand, I'm sending the hand back because it's, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. And when, you know, when we mulligan for game nights, we look for card advantage. Yep. Um, over ramp, over anything else, you want card advantage to make sure that your deck will do more things later. Um, so the more that you mulligan, the more cards you know that you're looking for, the more, or the more that you goldfish, excuse me, the more information you have on what cards you want in the early games and what cards are like, this is late game, this isn't going to do anything. Yeah, it's, it, it's really a question of, you know, because I've played those first five turns, and in most games, I'd say the first three turns or stuff, you're unlikely to get um, mm -hmm. interacted with a ton. So those first three turns often do play out similar to goldfishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might get an attack in or whatever, but there's not a lot. Uh, CDH is different, obviously, but there's yeah. not a ton of, like, removal being thrown around in the first three turns. And so if you've played 100 first three turns with your deck, that's the pretty close to what 100 first three turns would look like in regular mm -hmm. commander games. And so you can really learn a lot of like, because there's questions sometimes, oh, I have a ramp piece, but I have another two drop. Mm -hmm. And usually the ramp piece is right. Like the 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 normal philosophy in commander and magic in general is get more mana on the table now because that mana compounds 
Like, mm-hmm. I get that extra mana on turn three, on turn four, on turn five, on turn six, and by turn six, I've gotten six extra mana, and that advantage is worth getting the mana out early, even if I have another two drop. Mm-hmm. But maybe your commander is a three drop that triggers off combat damage or something, and now yeah. you're, you're not in the realm of like, hey, I'm going to play my signet first. You're like, no, I'm going to play this two drop, then I'm going to play my three drop commander, attack, get that trigger, and then I'm going to deploy my signet on turn mm-hmm. four. And double and dr- spell. And, yeah, and play a, a three drop with it. And those are things you wouldn't necessarily know it's, it's more obvious in that case, but there are cases where it's that's not clear until you play the deck enough mm-hmm. to know, like, oh, when I have the choice, I want this kind of card. And I think it's important, and we talk about this when we talk about deck building, building to think about your deck in terms of, like, categories of cards. We mm-hmm. talk about sack outlets and token makers and pump spells. What are the sort of columns of your deck? And that can also help you say, like, oh, stuff from this column I want to deploy in this order. Um, mm-hmm. And, again, that's all stuff you learn through gold yeah. fishing, or at least refine. You usually go in with an idea how you want to do it, but then what do they say? No uh, combat plan uh, lasts through first contact with the enemy, right? Mm-hmm. Like all plans go out the window as soon yeah, as the as battle soon as, yeah, they're, yeah. yeah. So you can test battle here and you can understand like, oh, I thought I would want to deploy my ramp first, but actually in this deck, I want to get going. If yeah. I have it, I want this. And like you said, I might want to mulligan at least once for free to try and get that certain kind of effect in my opening hand because my deck's so much smoother when I have, Mm -hmm. you know, the card that damages everybody that costs less than my commander. Mm. Um, Related to sequencing is curve. I Mm. find a lot of the time I start recognizing when my hand feels gunked up when I'm goldfishing, when I'm like, I have two four drops and they're fighting with each other and one wants to be down first, but if I don't... if I don't cast this now, my mana is going to be awkward next turn. So you start to see where there's um, sort of st- sticky points where you're like, okay, I need more mana if I want to have both of these things, or I really need to slim down my four and five drops. I would just have way too much top end. It's taking me way too long to get to the double spelling point. Um, so you can start recognizing when you're like, okay, I, my three mana rocks are really feeling weird or my two mana rocks are feeling inefficient and I'm going to play my two mana commander and have a more powerful three mana rock. Th- those kind of things you start to recognize when you play the first five turns a lot. You know, like I think the best built decks are the ones that know what's happening on one, know what's happening on two, know what's happening on three. And they're just like confident in their curve and know what their game plan looks like when it's executed well. And that's all gold fishing, baby. Yeah. Yeah. That's, oh man, it's great. I love talking about this because you, you're like curving. I'm like, oh yeah, that is another great yeah. thing to learn. So many things you learn. Yeah. And I think people would think out there like, oh, well, of course a deck wants to play a one and then a two and then a three and then a four. And it's not that your deck is always going to do what it's going to do, mm. but you just know what it wants to do. And you're trying to lean in fa- in your deck building in favor of what it wants to do. And mm. that... That's another thing you run to constantly in Goldfish that learns that teaches you to change your deck, which is glut of four drops, mm-hmm. glut of three drops. My commander's at three, and I have tons of three drops. And it's I look at all the three drops, and I'm like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I want that in my deck. I want all these. And but then when you play the deck, you learn, oh, the way the deck normally plays out on turn five, I'm just wasting two mana every every game. turn, yeah. every game. So I would just be way better off to take a bunch of my three drops, turn them into two drops, even if the two drops are a little bit worse than the three drops, mm-hmm. because I'm still just being mana efficient. I'm getting farther ahead on turn three, on turn four or five or whatever it is mm-hmm. than I was in the other build where, yeah, the cards all look good, but I just can't play all the three drops. Like, yeah, I just don't have that mana. I'm waiting extra turn. I'm wasting two mana. I'm passing the turn and that mana's just gone forever, right? Whereas... That that's one of the like critical theories of magic that I think has withstood the test of time, and it's not ironclad. It's not like it never, you know, it always works. But in general, the players that use the most mana over mm-hmm. the course of the game, like actually spend the most mana, are in the better positions to win. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've been talking about this kind of a lot, but card considerations are a really big deal. We've been talking about sort of general considerations, but specific cards you learn a lot when you're like. This this card itself is excellent, and I need I'm gonna go back to Scryfall and I'm gonna look at for any card that mm. feels or looks like this card. Yeah, and then or so you you can find a card that you're like this kind of card feels bad. Like I was goldfishing a deck that had a lot of pump spells and had one mana pump spells and had two mana pump spells that were more powerful. And I was like, the two mana pump spells are never good. Like they always feel, because I had Krark in the command set. So I was like, I just can't spend two mana multiple times. And it was like, even if these are better cards, they 
I just feel never find a spot to terrible. use. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. To to cast because they're they're so inefficient, possibly multiple times. Yeah, that herky jerky feeling, that mm. awkward feeling where you're looking at your cards and like this feels awkward. Yeah. Like there's things I want to do here that feel like I should reasonably be able to like deploy a couple of things and I can't. And the order of things is like tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that when you find a card and you're like, oh, every time I have this type of effect, it feels great. Mm -hmm. And so you go back and you're like, Scryfall, what's, and a lot of times it's weird effects. I remember a yeah. deck I was building, I forget what the deck, but I just realized like, I just want haste. I just want creatures with haste. Yeah. I don't care almost what else they do. I need three mana creatures that have haste. And yeah. I just looked up all the three mana creatures in those colors that had haste. And I was like, well, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. That's reasonable. That's reasonable. Put five of them in there, took out five other cards. And the deck just felt really good, just the what it wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was like all of the other considerations. Yes, I would love cool enter the battlefield effects. And I would like individually, the. I'd like it to give me the monarch or something, but mm -hmm. whatever. Three mana creature with haste was what I really needed for the deck to just feel like I did this and then this and then this and then this. And I used all my mana on every turn. And I got mm -hmm. my value from my other triggered effects and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I the other thing that I really like doing in goldfishing, as especially because I goldfish digitally, uh, is testing expensive cards before I buy uh, them. Oh, this is so smart. So if you if you're like, all right, I think my deck really wants like an anointed procession, which is like a forty dollar card. It's uh, I put it in the deck and just see what feels is like. Is it worth spending forty dollars? to put this in the deck, or is it kind of fine? Can I replace it with something else? Do I need to double the number of tokens that I'm making? $40 need. Is uh, it one of those decks where the, it has like a ton of four drops, cool. and yeah. I don't need a lot of four drops, I'm going to cut some four drops anyway, might and that well might be one of them. I'm going to cut the $40 one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't make it that much better. Maybe, maybe, but maybe again, Annoying Procession, you're very like, powerful. No, it is. Maybe you're like, this is sweet, and I just wish I had Annoying Procession in my hand mm. every time. Okay, fine. Then you know it's worth the $40. I mean, it's like, Try the jeans on first before you buy them, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. I think it's super smart. Just write on a post-it, put it inside, or maybe not a post-it because it's sticky, a piece of yeah. paper, put it inside the sleeve. And, and just play with it. Just See play it, it hundred like. Yeah, goldfish a hundred times. And you'll, then when you do purchase the card, you'll know you really want it. Because mm -hmm. I think we've all done the opposite. We're like, this card's sweet. I know I want it. And it's still sitting in my binder. Yep. And you <laughs> bought it for a very specific deck, and it really didn't work the way you wanted it to. And yeah. you're like, I think I just wanted to own the card, but now I'm not playing it. <laughs> I could just have those $60 back. Yeah. that Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we mentioned this, but is there is there a path to victory? And by turn five, you're like, do I have a plan? Uh, am I going to get to the late game and be a threat in the game? Yeah. Do I feel confident that I would be able to close it out from here or find a way to close mm -hmm. it out? So that could be in my in our token example. I've made a lot of tokens, and now all I need to do is pump them in order to kill mm -hmm. my opponents. And, you know, I'm on turn six or seven. I somehow got 20 tokens or something out there. That feels like the, a good amount that I could. Even if I don't have Crater Hope even within my hand, maybe I've got a card engine going. Yeah. That means ah, I'm, I have seven or eight payoffs. I'm likely to find one. I'm doing stuff every turn, and it's really snowballing from here. Do I have the specific Crater Hoof? No, but I feel confident I would have a good chance to win this game. Sure, they could disrupt me in other things, but maybe I have Heroic Intervention in my hand, and this feels like a good spot. Mm. Whereas if I got to this spot, I would be happy. Whether I win the game or not, my deck, I know it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about is just, do you like it? Mm. Sometimes you build a deck and you're like, well, it works, <laughs> but I don't know if I want to play this wheels deck. I built Riel in, in online when Riel came out and it's like, whenever you discard, you draw extra cards. Card's sweet, but. It's sweet. And I was like, that's awesome. And she's like, a wizard grandma that rules. And then you play it and you're like, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I've got three wheels. I don't know. I don't have... I have a hundred cards and I don't know what to do with them <laughs> and I have no payoffs and I just didn't end up building the deck. I yeah. felt a little powerful for my play group. It felt, it was sort of outside of my style and it wasn't something I was really excited to build. And then I didn't waste all that money and all that time building that deck. I was going to say, that's another really good way to not buy the anointing procession yeah. and, and also not buy the other 62 cards that yeah. would go <laughs> in the deck too. So that can save you a lot of money. Yeah. Which we've all built decks and then realized, you know, the third or fourth time we play them that we don't like it. And now, you know, I have decks that are just sitting on the shelf that, yeah, they're full decks and I could play them. Mm. But whenever I'm like going to Commander and I'm like, I'll take this deck, I'll take this deck, I'll t I never take that one. Yeah. S you know, and it's like, maybe I haven't even admitted to myself really that I don't like it, but clearly demonstrated by my actions, I mm. do not like it. So yeah. have yeah. you ever heard of that thing that like, when you clean out your closet for the summer, you're supposed to turn all your hangers backwards. And then when you wear something, you put it back correct. And at the end of the year, all the hangers that are backwards 
you, you just, just get throw rid that of all stuff. Of those. Yeah, give it to Goodwill. Yeah, yeah. You just get rid of all those clothes. You're not wearing. It, that's how we feel about a lot of commander decks. I have a version of that. It was just called moving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm not taking all the stuff that's still in a box. I clearly have it. I don't care about. <laughs> Unload it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can learn from gold fishing. Uh, generally, it's going to make you a better pilot. It's going to make you uh, more aware of how your decks play and uh, more. Re- uh, receptive to like when your commander is like, I do not want four drops. Yep. Stop putting those in. Yep. Uh, when you when you do get to play, when you like once a week or once a month or even less, if you don't get to play as much, when you play, your deck is more likely to work if you've practiced it beforehand. If you've yeah. goldfished a lot. Yeah, I find goldfishing to be fun, a little bit cathartic. Mm-hmm. You know, you got some, you, you put on, you know, some Netflix series. Yeah. And you, you don't have to do it for hours at a time, but an hour of goldfishing. But I often get into it where I'll start and I'll be like, I'll give it an hour. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it's two and a half hours later, my girlfriend's like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> and you're like, what? And I'm like, I'm just going to goldfish like five more times. <laughs> Three hours later, you know, just because I'm like, oh, this, this. Yeah. And then I'm just making little notes. I'm like, I know I'm going to change this. And at the end of the day, I'm changing five or six cards. It's not a ton. Yeah. But I feel really good in it. Getting into that mode, like, oh, the deck is like rolling. I want to mm-hmm. do that again. Like, yeah, it, it it tickles a certain part of your brain. So I actually like it. It's it's like commander players don't want to play against interaction anyway. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually like the perfect form of commander. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. There's no interaction. It's yeah, great. It's actually your deck great. works every time. <laughs> You're like, and then I kill all table. Yes, <laughs> champion again. <laughs> I've wondered. This is a total tangent, but I've often wondered if it's like not a little bit detrimental to goldfish or like draft mm. on an arena right before you go to bed because I feel like. I lay down on my pillow and I'm just like card interaction is just rolling yeah. in my head and it's hard for me to like actually doze off. Yeah, because yeah. because you're just lo- locked in. Yeah, brain's just running program of yeah. like this card goes with that card and then I'll play this card and that'll <laughs> play that card and you're like just okay, but let's talk about it in the morning. No, because what if I draw that? Then I would do this. Especially when you draft because whenever I, oh, I yeah. because I draft and then I play it until I'm done and then I'm like. But I could draft one. I don't have to play any of the games. Yeah, exactly. I'll just draft one more time. Then you draft it. You build the deck. Well, I got to play one. Well, I got to play <laughs> one game. <laughs> and then your brain's going like, "Oh, I should have picked this over this that." One, then, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. like, "Oh, I could play." Well, what if I draw this and that? I got to play another game. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, we've been talking a lot about you know why it's good. This has been a, a real. Um, you know, lesson in in showing and telling, not showing. Yeah, we're we're trying to sell <laughs> it to you for this next part of the of the program, which mm. is going to be the part where we actually go through and goldfish a couple of our decks, mm. um, and show you our process for goldfishing. And I think what's cool is like I mostly goldfish in person, although I do like to do it digitally as mm. well. But I, you know, like I said, I like to be in front of like the TV and just kind of yeah. feel the cards and everything. But you mostly goldfish on. I goldfish almost exclusively digitally yeah. on Architect. Yeah. And Architect has a great uh, mm-hmm. setup for this, which is one of the reasons I've started doing digitally more. It's is awesome. Their it's really Architect's helpful. playtester is the best in the biz for sure mm. and has converted me a lot. I got to admit, as an old guy, uh, I'm like, yeah, I do digitally goldfish a lot more than I used to. Mm. I still do like to do it by hand when I can, but it's a lot more convenient to do it on there. So we're going to do it both ways. Mm. So you can, and and then, you know, Rachel and I, I think we agree on a lot of things about goldfishing, but we're not the same. Obviously. No, we don't. We don't. So, gold, you goldfish much faster than I do too. I'm, I'm excited to watch you do it digitally though, yeah. because I bet you're faster than computer. And then mm. just the way you think about it, I'm excited to watch that. Yeah. Just because I've seen Jimmy do it and we learned a lot from each other. And I'm mm-hmm. often, one of the things that happens a lot for game nights is we get together and everybody, the you know, like an hour or so before we play, everyone's goldfishing their deck just to get ready for the game, refamiliarize themselves and things mm-hmm. like that. And I've often watched other people come in from the outside goldfish. And some are good, but I got to admit, some people I'm like, w- uh, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> You're doing a lot of shuffling. Yeah. It just feels that is not an efficient Reading way to do it. Reading your whole deck. Yeah. I don't, yeah. yeah, exactly. Reading every card. It's just like, ah, you know. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we can help everybody out there be a little bit better, and I think it'll make your decks just hum a lot more earlier in the process so that you will just, from the first time you play them, have a lot more success with them. Not necessarily win, mm. but just, like, do stuff and have fun. Yeah. And, of course, we are going to get to that after a few words from our sponsors. Okay, things are looking dire. We really need to think this out. All right, if I play Warrior's Instincts against the Scorn Shadow, I'll draw extra cards because it's a combat challenge. Uh, you have to be careful of the Soul Mask trap. It punishes your card draw. Oh, yeah, good point, good point. Wait, hold on. Your Fist of the Wind and my Sneak Attack are both better in combat, so maybe that's the line here. Oh, that could work. yeah. Card draw and synergies. 
This looks cool. Scorn Stockade. What is this? We just picked it up. It's the new Kinfire Dell. This is a co-op strategy card game. Yeah, and it's super fun. And you can play with three people? Well, Scorn Stockade is two players right out of the box, but if you combine it with the previous set, you can play up to four players. Just like Commander. The rules are really easy to pick up, but the game has a lot of depth. You have to play smart to win, just like Magic. And you face different challenges every single game, so you really gotta adapt on the fly. Plus, it was only 20 bucks. Wait. I think I got it. If I play Knockout, I can just destroy the mass directly. Ooh, then I can boost you with a coordinated attack. But is that gonna be enough? It will be, if we get a little lucky. Okay. Yay! <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, okay. I want in next game. All right, shuffle this up and draw five cards. Order Kinfire Delve Scorn Stockade at kinfiredelve.com and use code COMMAND10 at checkout for 10% off. That's a whole lot of game for just 20 bucks. Plus, pick up the first set, Vainglory's Grotto, for the full four-player experience. Again, that's kinfiredelve.com and use code COMMAND10 to score 10% off. Josh, when we first started the Command Zone podcast, did you ever think it was going to turn into a full-blown business? Absolutely not. I mean, honestly, I didn't think we were going to last a year. <laughs> but now we moved into a brand new space with a full staff making more content than ever. Yeah, it's been quite a journey. But luckily, we found a lot of great tools to help us along the way, like Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, whether you're at the apartment stage or in the full office suite. For a long time, we didn't have a merch store because, well, the logistics can get pretty daunting. But Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform helped us expand what we could offer and get our stuff in the hands of our fans. Tons of businesses use Shopify, like Brooklinen, Rothy's, Allbirds, and you can see why. They've got the internet's best converting checkout, powerful tools like Shopify Magic, and an award-winning support system that's there for you no matter what. It just makes the selling side of your business that much easier. So you can focus on the things you really care about, like playing magic, or talking about playing magic, or playing magic. You know what, Josh? We do have cool jobs. Yeah, we do. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash TCZ, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash TCZ now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Again, shopify.com slash TCZ. Hey, psst, over here, it's me, Tunnel Tipster. You want to save some dough this year, right? I got a hot tip for you. If you switch to Mint Mobile, you can get a wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month. Big wireless? Those guys are suspect. They don't want you to know about this. But with Mint Mobile, you can have a three, six, or 12 month plan. Then you ain't got to worry about monthly phone bills at all. That way, you can get up to your heart's content with a limited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network of informants. I did a little digging, and I found out you can even keep your old phone, all your numbers, contacts, the whole shebang. Which is great unless you're trying to be in disguise, in which case, get a new number, I guess. So switch to Mint Mobile and get your first three months of Primo Wireless for just 15 bucks a month. But if anyone asks, you didn't hear it from me. I'm just a cute little mole. I don't know nothing. Tell him it was Ryan Reynolds or something. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And then I'm gonna flash out Illusory Ambusher. I will bolt it to draw three cards. I will sneak attack out Triska Decafile. I'm gonna go to my upkeep and I will win the game. That was your first time playing the deck? Yeah. Well, I mean, first time in paper. I've already goldfished it like a hundred times on Architect. Their play tester is super user friendly. Playing cards just takes one click and you can mulligan, tutor, and move through your turns with the press of a key. There are simple menus with counters and copies and you can take notes on cards as you play them. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and play test commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Welcome back everybody. We are talking about gold fishing, playtesting, playing all by yourself. And we're going to do some examples. We're going to walk through some goldfishing of Game Nights decks that you know. And uh, it, I, we want to give a word of warning. We're going to do our best to describe what is happening. But if you're listening to this on audio only, this is going to be a very visual part of the show. So maybe go check it out on YouTube to get the full experience. But we are going to do our best to say what is happening as it's happening. Yeah, some things are just better uh, sort of uh, presented in a visual medium, and I think the better experience will be definitely to watch it. Again, yep. if you're if you, that's not available to you, we'll do our best here. Yep. Okay. All right. All right, well, let's start here um, with the Tesa Opulent Oligarch deck that I played on the most... Uh, was it the most recent? Not no, most second recent, to no. most recent. It was the Karlov Manor episode of Game Nights uh, with Aaron Hansen. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Tesa... I'll just remind people, at the beginning of each end step, 
you investigate for each opponent who lost life this turn. So you can investigate up to three times if all of your opponents have lost at least one life during your turn. And then whenever you um, a clue you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you create a 1-1 one, one spirit creature token of flying, but you can only trigger this ability once each turn. Okay. So you make clues based on damaging opponents, and then those clues turn into 1-1s. One, mm -hmm. um, Which help you damage your opponents. Yeah. So once that... This is a... Parts of it are an engine unto itself, and really just getting going is damaging your opponents kind of the first couple of times, and then after that, the spirits can mostly do the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our hope anyway, and we will see through gold fishing. So I've already shuffled the deck. I'm not going to shuffle it again just so we can get started right away. Um, the first thing I always do is obviously draw the seven cards, and we look at them just like Rachel said. I don't keep hands with soul rings. Because, mm -hmm. of course, your deck's going to look good on hand opening hands that have soul rings, so that doesn't give you any useful data. Uh, usually, if the hand's good otherwise, I would just take the soul ring out, put it back in the deck, draw the next card off the top. Like Rachel said as well, if it's worthy of a mulligan, you mulligan it. If it's not, you don't. This one is playable, so we're just going to see how it goes. It's got a two drop, a skull clamp, and the, it's, it feels like it's going to be pretty good. All right, so I'm going to start, and I'm going to draw for turn. I'm going to play my lands. I'm going to play that skull clamp. Then I'm going to draw for turn. I'm going to play my second lands, and I'm going to play a corpse knight. Then I'm going to untap. I'm going to play my third land for turn, which will be this godless shrine. I don't keep track of my own life total. It doesn't matter here. Uh, I'm going to attack with the corpse knight. I'm going to assume that I probably have an open attack as long as I did, probably didn't go last. And just for the, the sake of it here, we're going to assume that. I'll play my Tesa, and then I will make a clue token because... Well, you make three, right? Because the Corpse Knight drains the table. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. The Corpse Knight drains the table when Tesa comes in. So I will make three t clue tokens. So the thing about goldfishing, especially uh, with live cards, is you want to not take a lot of time to do any of these side things. So like, am I going to put a dice on my token? No, I'm just going to generally keep track of how many you have. Mm -hmm. I know I've got three. Uh, okay, so then I'm going to tap on my next turn. I'm going to draw. I'm going to play a fetch land. Now, the way I play fetch lands when I'm goldfishing is I don't actually fetch. I don't actually do anything. I just say, okay, cool. I would go get a land that can tap for either mana. It doesn't really matter that much. Can I cast spells? Yes, I can. Okay, so now I'm probably in the mode. I have a deadly dispute in hand, which I could cast a Marionette Mas Marion Master that I couldn't, and three lands. I'm probably in the realm where I am paying to, to sack a clue, draw a card, make a spirit, drain everybody with the Corpse Knight. And now I have something I can clamp if I want to, or I have this deadly dispute. And my deck is already feeling pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. I had a one drop, a two drop, a three drop. On that three drop, I drained everybody. I made the three clues. And on the follow-up play, I even am able to use all my mana if I want to. The good thing I'm already learning about Tesa, which I knew from before, let's be real, is that two mana is really easy for me to use. So if I ever have two left over, clue, make a spirit token. And I'm obviously going to do that on my opponent's turn, so I get another spirit on that turn. But the two drop slot is a great, like, flexible spot for me because I can just sort of always use an extra two mana. Doesn't mean I don't want two drops, though, because I obviously wanted something on two to damage the table. So that's as far as I would go right now, right? I have a Marionette Master. I got a Kaya. I can play these things. I can do stuff with them, but I don't need to learn anything further. That felt good. Now, the question would for me would be, as I continue to Goldfish here, is that abnormal for my deck or is that normal? Is that how it plays or is that not how it plays? Like, you can have a a game or two where you get a really good draw. But I know already the pieces that I like. And to be fair, this deck is a little more refined maybe than most mm. goldfish decks. It's but been goldfished a lot. Yep. Uh, okay, so we're going again. Again, I'm not worrying too much about super shuffling or getting mm -hmm. every card in play or whatever. Um, okay, so this has like seven lands. We're going to mull it. Too many lands is a thing you just sort of make note, and not enough lands is a thing you make note. But again, if you're going to goldfish 100 times, you're going to expect that to happen sometimes. You don't know yet whether that's an anomaly or a regular thing. And if it was a regular thing, you'd go, do I have too many lands or do I have not enough? And you would adjust. Here we go. This is a skull clamp hand, which is probably going to be good. And I have a, a signet too. So we're going to play it. It's going to be, I guess these are all untapped. Oh, I didn't keep a white mana. Okay, that's fine. I do have the signet. So it's skull clamp into, and now we have some slightly interesting things to think about because and this is a sequencing thing I would think about, right? I have two two drops, a Bartolome de Del Presidio, a Homicide Investigator, and an Orzhov Signet. Now, if I play my Signet, it doesn't really change whether I can get Tesa out next turn mm -hmm. because I'll just have that one floating mana. 
but the Signet can attack. So I think the probably correct here and what I would want to do in this deck most of the time is to play a creature. So I'm going to play Bartolome because it's because it uh, synergizes a little bit better with the Skull Clamp and not deploy my Signet, which feels weird. Yeah, you don't have a white mana right now to cast the Bartolome, but it's... Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. I don't have a white mana. Yeah. Oh, you're right. So, so I can't it, do it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's uh, That's interesting. But it does tell me, I think... This deck is a little abnormal mm -hmm. in that a couple of now scenarios I would rather play a, a creature rather than my rather. signet or yeah. my two mana rock. Sometimes in that situation when I'm goldfishing, I would just play the white black creature and note that I'm having problems with white mana. Yeah. Uh, because it's like I prefer to do this now. So maybe I want a little more white than I right. thought. So because. I'm just going to follow like what the deck wants to do rather than how my mana is restricting me right now. Yeah, and I can make the adjustments. And I think that's a smart way to think mm. about it as well. So that's another note in the head. So let's say we did that. We said, okay, maybe we're going to switch a swamp or two for a plane so we're more likely to hit our white mana and then how's that play from here? I draw. I drew another swamp so we're already in favor of your little change there. Mm -hmm. I play Tesa. I attack with Bartolome. I get one clue, which is not as good as three, but better than zero. Mm -hmm. And it will kind of get us going because with one clue and a skull clamp, I can all of a sudden... Now, you know, at my velocity is pretty good. And look at it again. So this is, we've only goldfished four or five times, mm -hmm. and I'm already deploying my two-mana rock on After, four, yeah. which is not necessarily bad. And I think that shouldn't give you the note of like, hey, let's not have ramp in the deck. Because mm -hmm. a another thing I like to note when I'm playing decks is like on turn six, am I looking at, you know, eight or nine mana I, mm -hmm. that I can work with? Because if I'm only looking at six mana, I'll probably lose that game. Mm -hmm. That's just not how commander works these days. So, but it is interesting, and it could lead us towards, you I know. mean, do you, like, is this a Gilded Lotus deck? Yeah. Like, do you play the big rocks instead Thrawn of the Dynamo little ones on two? Yeah, a Thrawn Dynamo on four, four. Think of how decent Thrawn Dynamo would be here, right? I play Thrawn Dynamo, I crack a clue with it, Skull Clamp. And Clamp. So, that's a, it's a thing where you wouldn't th think of Thrawn Dynamo in this deck, and mm. now you could consider it. Yeah. And it's, it's not a thing where you go, oh, I've goldfish five times, I make that choice. It's mm -hmm. like... Little notes in my head. We'll see. I'm going to do this 90 more times, and f and if that scenario comes up enough, mm -hmm. then I can feel good about it. So you do something that I don't do as much, where you'll switch cards in and out of your deck? Yes. So, yeah, that's a good point. So one thing I... When we're building decks, I think a lot of people do this. Mm. Uh, I usually build a deck that's like 115 cards, and a lot of times... <laughs> I'll raise my hand and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll tell on myself here. I will just order those cards from Card Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just slam. Because, like, right now, I can't make those decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so There's I'm like, a lot of pressure. Yeah. I'd rather just have them. Yeah, so <laughs> this is why my collection is so out of control. <laughs> That, guilty. Yeah. Um, yeah. AD does that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why did you buy that? Uh, you know you're not going to buy that. I thought that. I might. Yeah. I could. It's cool. So I take the, and, and you know, we get down to like, we're at 95 cards. We have five more that can c go in, but we have 20 to choose from. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'm not clear on, it's maybe even the last 10 where I, it's hard for me to know. Am I making the right choices? And eventually mm -hmm. you're like, I have to get to 100 so I can goldfish and go to the next step. So I'm going to make choices here, but I'm not confident that I this card is actually better than that one or I wouldn't rather have this. And so what I do sometimes is I'll put the cards that are on the bubble kind of off to the side. Oh, yeah. Mm. Sorry, camera can't see off the play mat. Yeah. Like this. And then I'll either notate the 10 cards that were kind of last in. Sometimes I'll even, like, put a little white piece of paper if, you know, it's, uh, it's more than normal into those sleeves just so I know. Okay. And then when I draw those cards, I'll just look over at these and be like, do I wish this card in my hand was one of those cards? Mm -hmm. And then in, when you're doing a paper, there's a nice thing you do. You just literally switch it and play it out. And then you can just play the deck with that card in it from now on and just see, does it feel better than it did with that? And you can continue to kind of do that until you get down to the cards that you know you know it's super smart i i love this thought because it's um and it's something that you can't do in digital is is just look at cards directly and be like okay i made the choice to put this card in the deck but would i how often am i making the choice to have it be something else. Yeah. And it means you get to test with more cards than you normally would. I just play with 115 cards, and if I don't draw a land, I know my land balance is, yeah. is off, and I'll usually just bottom until I hit a land. Yeah. Uh, so I can play all of the cards. But I like this because you don't mess up your land balance. <laughs> 
Yeah, and you really do find as you do it, and you're like, oh, I wish this was that one. I wish mm-hmm. this was that one. You pretty clearly get to. I never wish anything was this. This is gone. Yeah. Yeah. I never wish anything was that. And you get it narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down. And maybe it doesn't get you all the way exactly to 100, but you get mm-hmm. a lot closer than you were before. It's not 20, it's three. Mm-hmm. You know? And you're like, okay, cool. I'm pretty sure this is the right 100, and those three might still be in contention, but these 17 are gone. Mm-hmm. Like, I just never really cared about them that much. And so, yeah, that is, uh, that is one little advantage of paper. Um, the speed is the advantage of yeah, digital. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as fast as I'm going, it, it's, it is faster on paper. All right, so I have a hand here. It looks a little awkward, but we're going to play it. I'm going to draw for a turn because it has two three drops and a four drop. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to play my Bojuka Bog because it's a tap land. Rip Graveyard recur- or graveyard Hates. And I don't have a true drop. And now we're seeing, which we probably could have guessed, but it's, not, it's nice to kind of get confirmation, which is like, oh, boy, this is super awkward. Yeah. Because I don't have anything to attack, so if I play Tessa, I get nothing. But all my stuff also doesn't do much without Tessa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a protection racket, which is an upkeep trigger, which could be good if I play Tessa next turn. I think this one's going to be a little bit hard to tell because um, it would have a little bit to do with my opponents and things like that. I think if they didn't have, if it looked like I would probably have an attack, depending on the types of deck they are, mm-hmm. I might play Tesa because she can attack. Mm-hmm. But also, I do have this loyal subordinate, which I know I can follow up to Tesa and then pre-combat do the damage. So I can get my second turn that way, yeah. and I don't project it to my opponent. So I probably would play Tesa here, and then untap, and then play the loyal subordinate, mm-hmm. probably. But look how awkward we are. Yeah. Now you've got a four drop stuck in your hand that you didn't play, play because it's an upkeep trigger. Yep. So Twilight Prophet looks really weird here. Yep. And then you know that your loyal subordinate feels a little awkward because you're like, you want it, you really, really want it on two. Yep. But here it is on three. Yep. Yeah. I have a, uh, a Sivris in hand. It taps to sacrifice something. I don't have anything to sacrifice. It's a four drop, but I would it ha- because it's tap ability, I want to want to play it early so mm-hmm. that it can get online. So yeah, it, this is already a little awkward. Does it say anything to me about changes? Only just that... Okay, just keep that in mind. Just yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really, really wants two mana pingers, which is more of a black thing. But maybe it wants something like even cards that are like two mana make two one ones with evasion, which doesn't really exist. I can think of a three mana one make the yeah. lingering souls or something. It feels to me like I'm already thinking I would want some one drop creatures that are mm-hmm. in any way reasonable just because we already yeah. know we found a couple of spots where we have that one hanging mana mm-hmm. and a one drop creature is just something that could attack. Yeah, like a one mana menace creature or yeah. something. Yeah, like what's that one from um, MCAM that of, yeah. surveils every time a small creature comes in? That, that might be... Sure, Bane, f- Bane Hound. Yeah, or doing a little like bit of surveilling. Deck doesn't have a lot of recursion, but still, it's card selection. So it's it's reasonable. It's like mm. uh, the three mana haste thing I was talking about earlier. Where like, yeah, yeah, it, it like might the, just be worth it. The LCI creature that whenever you descend, you put a counter on it seems pretty good yeah, here. It's a one yeah. mana one, and it becomes removal later. Um, so maybe that's something, and that's not something that you would look at Tesa and think to put in the deck, right? But, but it's just so important to be able to damage at least one opponent the turn you play, which means mm-hmm. you need something online on turn three, not something you're playing on turn three, something that's already out there mm-hmm. that will deal damage to at least one opponent. Obviously, the best thing, and I got this in MKM, is something, it was Limdol's uh, Hex or whatever, yeah. that you know on upkeep, uh, it's a two drop, and on upkeep, it hits everybody for one. That's mm-hmm. the best case scenario, but there's just not a lot of cards like that. What yeah. was the card called? Stalactite Stalker is the one I was thinking yeah. from LCI. It's Menace, and then if you descended this turn, so... The activated ability is, can you remind me? Is removal. Uh, target creature, it's minus X, minus X until end of turn, where uh, X is Stalactite Stalker's power. So this is a great example. I love mm-hmm. this, because yeah. you would never think of this card, I don't think, no. initially for this deck. But I think this card's actually really good in this deck. Mm-hmm. It has a lot going on here that you wouldn't like. You wouldn't know to put these keywords in Descryfall. Right. But you're like, Descend. Interesting. Okay, what are all the cards with Descend? Is yeah. there anything else that's super cheap? They're two mana ones. The Menace is great. Mm-hmm. It's going to get the damage in. And then it's just not a blank card yeah. you know, later. It does stuff. So that's really, really cool. Um, okay, so we're goldfishing the next hand here. I'm going to draw for turn. We're going to, we don't have a one drop, so we're going to play this tap land. Da-da. We're going to, and I do have a two drop, which is a homicide investigator, which is great mm-hmm. because now I know at least I can attack on my next turn. And then I'll play Tesa, I'll attack, so now I have a clue. Mm-hmm. 
then I will. I'm going to move these cards because I think it was, we didn't mark any cards for what was on the bubble. And also this yeah. exercise has already been over. So we're going to move the cards <laughs> that we were thinking about at one point. Um, okay. And now I'm on turn four and I haven't made it past turn four too many times. So this is a little bit interesting. And you yeah, know what? plan is online fast in this yeah. deck. And you know what? I think we're in a better spot here, but still not great. And this is even, I think, more reinforcement to me that we want one drops because mm -hmm. I've got three drops that are good. I got Lord of the Third Path. I got uh, Nadir's Nightblade. I do have a couple of two drops, a Fracture and a Fanatical Offering. Mm -hmm. And who knows? Maybe I want to remove something. It is a little bit early. If I Fanatical Offering my clue, though, I don't have the two left over to use for the other clues. But if I have attacks this turn, it's different. Right. Fanatical offering is two mana, isn't it? Yeah, and so what I'm saying is I can get rid of that clue, mm -hmm. and as long as I can make another clue and use the other two mana on mm -hmm. the, the new clues that I'm about to make, that's right. good. So I think this hand is pretty good. So let's just say that happened, right? Let's say I was able to get in an attack on one opponent, so we're not being overly optimistic. Mm -hmm. I fanatic offering, make a map token, sack my clue, draw two. So the fanatical offering will just stand in for the map token. Mm -hmm. And now I have these two mana floating. I made my spirit. From the clue, I pass on my opponent's turn. I Correct. draw off clue. the clue. Make I have two spirit. spirits now. And now I'm good because I have two spirits and I can feel pretty confident I'm going to be able to get in on at least an opponent or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the plan's online. And now I might play a little bit further in to this one just mm -hmm. to see how it feels. Um, taste is pretty good. Taste is sweet because the spirits that yeah. other Taysa makes are black and white. Yeah. So there's some really neat synergy going on between those two cards. So that feels pretty strong to me. I have a Phyrexian Tower out, so I've got a little bit of pseudo ramp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I might play Taysa here and sort of set up for now I can crack a clue, get my third spirit. Anything bad happens, I can remove that target creature. And get spirits back. Yep. So this is a, a, a way to sort of feel pretty safe. And I... Like to play in a reasonable manner where, like, my my opponents will have threats. I don't see them. But, like, what am I likely to be wanting to do at this point in the game? And, like, oh, be able to keep myself a little bit safe is a thing I probably would want to be able to do here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then, yeah, this is what we're learning. I'm learning that four drops are a little bit awkward. Uh, They're a little strange. And you because you always have mana sinks in this deck. You always have two mana that you can spend. So trying to keep everything else efficient so you can hold up an activation of a clue. Um... A two mana instance, I think I found when I was gold fishing this deck that it was they're really, really powerful. Yeah. Because it's either a clue, it's like for like fracture is the is it a sorcery or is that an instant? It's an instant. Yeah. Is is either a removal spell if you have to spend it or it's two mana to crack a clue. Yeah. And that's means you that don't have to yeah, is great. it's awesome. That yeah. feels incredible. But three mana removal spells feel terrible. Right. Because now you're wasting mana uh, instead of cracking the clue. But three mana spells feel pretty good. We found ourselves in a number of cases mm -hmm. where we've... Because you're playing Tesa on three. Mm -hmm. On four, if you've had any amount of ramp... For one thing, on four, you can always crack two clues. You can always use that mana. Yeah. Or not always, but you're hoping you can. Or a two drop plus a clue mm -hmm. is pretty good. Then on five, you get an awkward position. If I play the four on four, don't do anything else, that doesn't feel great. If I play the four on five, I'm wasting that one mana. So threes are good in kind of... Uh, mm. multiple places so i don't know i'm feeling like my f have we cast a four drop yet i don't think we have i don't think so yeah so um, i um yeah and we haven't gone that much expensive. farther we haven't gone super far yeah uh usually you're trying to double spell on turn Turns, four still yeah uh turn four or five um but, it, it, this this one was like made the investigator stick out a lot because he never triggered it as well but it's just a two mana creature and that felt great so you're like okay two mana evasive creatures are really really where this deck wants to be yeah I think it's super reasonable because you know people are going to want to kill taste on your other creatures yeah. and being able to get some value and that's part of your plan right you got a clue sitting there you replay Tessa yeah. you can start going again yeah but you can see the kind of thing that we're like talking about and noticing is just like do I want to cast this at any point is there ever a point where it's like this feels like the one to cast yeah. and obviously Lauren is different because that's interaction you may want to slam that so, uh, like in a very they specific got a moment Boom. great so yeah. I would absolutely use Lauren to, yeah. when to kill here I'd kill the soul ring absolutely yeah. but but a proactive spell like the uh, the thousand year smithy is is a spell that, that you're like you should want to get in the curve somewhere and it's just hard, being hard to find a place. But we haven't gotten yeah. super far past. But you yeah. can you have a limited amount of card slots available in your deck for past turn five or not. Mm -hmm. Just because 
most of their spells you're going to want to have the optionality to deploy them early like mm-hmm. that's why you can't run a lot of seven drops it's not because they're not good on sevens because they're not good on one two three four four and five yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think you know w- i would goldfish this thing you know 50 more times mm-hmm. 60 more times but we're already leaning in certain directions and i love that we already sort of found like i would 100 percent put this uh stalactite stalker mm-hmm. into the deck um and i would probably be looking for a couple more reasonable ones because it does feel so good when you just have a creature online that you can attack with. This is mm-hmm. a soul ring hand with five lands, so we're going to throw yeah. it back. Um, a lot of the time with soul ring, too, you can just bottom the soul ring and draw a new card. Yep. Um, it can be fun to goldfish with soul ring hands, but it is sort of a waste of your time if you're just trying to learn things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Because like you, what you're not going to learn, two lands. What you're not going to learn is that soul ring is bad. <laughs> that is, that <laughs> you is won't not learn what that. you're going to. You learn. won't learn that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I kept a two lander. This is Agadim, uh, the land side. I'll play it mm-hmm. tapped because I don't have a one drop. Then we'll play a command tower into our Orzhov Signet, mm-hmm. and we are wishing we had that Stalactite Stalker. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Then it, it, this Tesa would do something this turn. Well, at least we'd be efficiently losing, using our mana. But if mm-hmm. we had the Stalker earlier, but even yeah. if we had it now, at least okay, I got you it could out. Play it out now, and yeah. now I'm you know, and now I'm actually feeling okay because I'd be like Denny. Delny, attack, uh, yeah. Delny, sorry, uh, attack, get, get double clues. the amount of clues, mm-hmm. you know, pretty good. Uh, and Delny gives evasion to your commander. Yep, exactly. So, so I'm actually getting four clues, mm-hmm. uh, probably. Yeah. Although anything that can block might be small enough to block, but still. Um, yeah, so, and then I'm probably cracking the, cracking the clue, making the spirit, and now, yeah, if I had the select text stalker, of course, I would have to draw it, and there's a lot of other things, yeah. but I love reinforcing, like, oh, it's cool. Uh, you know what's really cool? We just goldfished this deck. It got goldfished a bunch. I think the deck's very strong. Mm. It had a good showing on game nights. Did a lot of stuff. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> Foha is yeah. quite an opponent. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we already found a thing we would change about it. Yeah. So we are, you know, and that's action? that's the power of goldfishing. Mm-hmm. All right, one more here. Soul Ring and Teferi's Protection. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The classic. Uh, that's a that's a Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> Hold that until I win the game later. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those cards that you're like, oh, this isn't good right now, but it is it will be, be good real. later. <laughs> All right, it's a little bit dicey because we only have two, but here, two lands. Okay, we found our third. That's good. I think our land situation has been pretty good. We were we tied a couple of times, but mm. in general, pretty good. Um, all right, Shattered Sanctum because I have no one drops into Corpse Knight, and we already know Corpse Knight beginnings are awesome mm-hmm. because... We play Tesa, drains everybody with the Corpse Knight, probably attack, make three clues, and that's, these starts feel amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Because yeah. now, even if there's a board wipe, you have three clues. Yeah. You've, you've spent, f- you know, five mana. Yeah. But who's board wipe on turn four? Yeah, 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 I don't know. <laughs> but you've done so much, and it's turn three. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a part where maybe I do f- play my four drop. Look, I found mm-hmm. a spot where it feels okay. Um, I got the three clues. I don't necessarily need to. I get the drain here Mm -hmm. from the Corpse Knight, and I get three more. So I'm going to untap with six clues and an active Sivris that, you know, I'm not probably going to use yet, but it's a tap ability. I like to have that online, just get it out there. It's a great sack outlet for your artifacts, right? So you can get a spirit out of this. You can either drain your opponents or draw some more cards. Sivris does a lot for this deck, but... And it's nice that there's a spot for it. Yep. But. I have Teferi's Protection, too, so I'm willing to sort of stick my neck out maybe a little mm. more than normal. Yeah. Yeah. And now I've got a Welcoming Vampire, really good with Clues and Spirits. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're kind of off to the races. Now, we don't have exactly a win condition, but I like what you said, which is it feels like this game, it'll be hard for us not to do a lot. Because mm. worst case scenario, they wipe my board, sack Clues, still going, still have stuff to do, still drawing cards. I think the main point of Commander is just doing the thing. You just came to play your deck, yeah. and Goldfishing gets you there yeah where like my deck is going to play it's like if you win or you don't huh that j- just means somebody stopped you yeah because but your when deck I press is the gas going on the to pedal, go the car moves the car moves yeah. yeah it works the 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 thing i might think about here and we haven't thought about it in any of the other gold fishing so i wouldn't put it high on my list but mm. as i did this 60 more times if it bumped up i might think about it is like all right i'm gonna have six and then i'm gonna have nine clue tokens and in this scenario i'm not cracking them that quickly mm. um you know, do I want some rituals or something that's going to give me a large influx of mana really quickly to be able to take advantage of that at some point? Yeah. Um, there's also cards like KCI, which are in the maybe board mm-hmm. for this, that uh, 
because they don't sack the clues to uh, or the the spirits and clues are just kind of good on their own. But maybe maybe you would want to think about like how do I take advantage if I find myself in a situation where I'm often got like twelve clues and I just can't. Yeah. You know, through paying two man, I'm never going to get through all those. Yeah. So it's just a thing to think about. Um, we also uh, know from like from the game that uh, reprocess was very powerful. Yeah. So maybe you're like, okay, do I put in a God Eternal Bantu? Bantu, yeah. Or something like another effect that's just like that. It hasn't been good in, in the gold fishing that we've gotten to, but you can see how the deck would create situations where Bantu would be great and drawing, you know, 12 cards is incredible. Yeah. And I think the thing about reprocess and Bantu that's interesting that as you added them to the deck, you'd have to keep an eye on is mm-hmm. like... Th- drawing it two of those is really bad yeah because you you almost never will want to use it the second time but mm-hmm. is it so good the first time that you would want to have twice as much chance to get it and that the answer could be yes maybe yeah, yeah. so that's another thing you could learn through gold fishing okay i think that's enough of gold fishing yeah you agree? yeah but this I, was, I think so this was super fun and I, I i hopefully people can see the potential of sort of how you think about things it's all about siloing off those different thoughts and then just kind of generally keeping tabs on where they're at in the list and as, as it bumps up it's like yeah it no it feels like i want one more one drops let's prioritize yeah. let's actually look up cards let's see what it is and maybe we would even find two or three more one drops to add yeah uh, and i my thought would be based on our other discussion we're probably cutting a couple of four drops to make room for the one drops yeah uh, which is think like a selfless spirit would be very good in this deck the sacks to give indestructible it's also two mana evasive creature so it gives you the combat damage and yep. protects your board yeah because we we want we really would love to do damage to all our opponents with a corpse knight or something, mm. but there's not enough of that effect that probably exists mm. at two not at two mana. Yeah. yeah, two or one mana. So we'll take the second best thing, which is like, hey, I can at least damage one opponent and mm. that you know, that gets us off to the start. So cool. Okay, that was fun. All right. All right, let's see. We're gonna what? do some digital gold fishing as well. Um, I am goldfishing one of my old Game Nights decks because it didn't function super well on camera. So we're going to see if we can get to the root of the problem with Toski Bearer of Secrets. Oh, this is an old one. This is an oldie oldie. So Toski, uh, a lot of Commander players know, but for those who don't, it's a four mana mono green squirrel. Can't be countered. It is indestructible. It attacks each combat a fable. And whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So I did something kind of weird with this deck. Uh, and I built a Voltron Toski deck, which obviously fights with the most powerful side of Toski, which is the whenever a creature deals combat yeah, damage, you, you draw a card. <laughs> uh, but I saw Indestructible Squirrel and was like... Indestructible Squirrel. Indestructible Squirrel. And I was like, well, I want to build an Indestructible Squirrel deck. Um So I want to keep that in mind because we know immediately that there are parts of the deck that are going to fight with each other. But let's see what it feels like. So we click on the play tester. This one draws the hand for you. Um, This is a little dodgy because it has the just two lands, but it's got a fertile ground, so we'll be fine. Uh, We don't have any card draw, which is a little concerning. Uh, So we'll keep this. Toski's card draw. So... The biggest thing about playing uh, playtesting online is learning your hotkeys. So I know that hitting an N takes me immediately to the next turn. Excuse me. Um, and what, I like that you can lock. There we go. Uh, oh, I didn't even know you could do that. You can, yeah, you can lock auras to creatures. I, I learned it specifically for this deck because nice. it's got so many auras. So now we've done a little bit of ramping, which is great because now that means that you can get Toski down on three. And we can start loading Toski up with our auras. So it's a little awkward now because we've got a Keeper of Fables, which yep. doesn't do anything because we're not wide. And we don't have any of our Enchantresses. In Search of Greatness, we've already sort of skipped, which is a little concerning as well. Um, that's a beast within. I want Ancestral Mask. So, But let's just get our game plan online here. We're going to hold up this two mana. And I don't know. I guess we have this. Does anybody block our 3-3 three, three Toski? For, excuse um, me, 5-5 five, five Toski on turn four? I would assume you would have a, at least an opponent. I think who, I probably have one where that's a very inconvenient block. So they're, Yeah, they're just I'll, taking it. I'll draw an extra card yep. here. It's turn four. I've already played all of my lands, so we're just going to pass and hold up. It. Uh, I guess we could play it in Search of Greatness. In those situations, I like to think about, like, well, what's reasonable not try to err yeah. on the side of like, oh, it's turn seven, I would get in with my 3-3 three, three on the ground. Yeah. Most of the time, nobody's going to chump block with their commander yeah. uh, or one of their like, set-up mana dorks or something like that. I'll I play sort of generally think of it as the power and toughness. Uh, if it's equal to or greater than the turn, mm-hmm. then you can probably get in with it. Yeah, I think that's fair. Or if it has any kind of evasion, then usually you can find somebody. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll play a Cathedral of War. It'll make our Toski a little bit bigger. Yep. 
And then, I mean, we've got a bow of Nylea, which gives us death touch, but we don't really need evasion when our when our creature is this big. I guess yep. we forgot to do our scry. I usually oh. just scry here. Uh, so that's a rancor. We do want that because trample is a really big deal in this deck. But look at our hand right now. None of this is doing what we want. So I guess we play out a, key, a keeper yeah, of fables. Right. No Voltron pieces. And go and draw two. But like what we really, really want is an enchantress or uh, anything that's going to draw more cards a little bit faster. But let's cast this Rancor. I think we're going to load up our Toski because we know that our auras are safest there. But yeah, I guess we like combine it with Death Touch and that gives us a little bit of power. I keep forgetting our Scry on Search of Greatness, which oh, yeah. means that it's probably not that important <laughs> in the deck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's we, we've got this online we've got yep. a pretty big Toski we, we know that there have been some problem pieces so usually I will start a new game at that point I would think about like yeah Sage of Fables being a, a draw one per turn engine is probably not worth five mana not at all but is it always that there's only one time so yeah this hand I don't like it doesn't do anything there's no ramp to no get ramp. Toski down earlier and these are really late game pieces so I'm gonna mulligan this one whoop no lands this uh, is the strength of digital mulligan yep. uh, uh, here we go. Uh, this hand looks a little bit better. Again, we've got a little bit to do before Toski, but no ramp in search of greatness here again. Yep. Uh, so we're going to go. We really would like a mana dork. We don't have a turn one play. Here's our turn two plays in search of greatness. Then we're going to scry. Do we want an obscuring haze now? Probably not. So we can move this straight to the whoop, bottom of the library. L is the hotkey for that. This is a slightly awkward turn because I do have a tapped land here that's going to be my fourth land for Toski so I either sort of skip my turn three and not run out the champion's helm or I hope I draw an untapped land for Toski those are tough positions man not great uh, also this is a tapped colorless land so I couldn't play it early to get it under in search of greatness so it is a little awkward but I think I'd rather you get cast the scry. on three yeah I do get the scry so we'll go to the next turn it is an untapped land great thank you in search of greatness we'll pay four and get Toski down. Notice how she didn't actually scry. She just drew it because she can always just put it in the... I can always put it on the bottom. Yeah, and yeah. just draw the next one. That's just a faster way to scry kind of than that way. Uh, I'm going to play out my tapped land here, I think, because we've got some three mana plays. We can pay one and equip this, and then we could pay three and equip our ancestral mask. This castle's felt a little weird because I don't have a ton of creatures, mm -hmm. but now we've got a big Toski who can attack, and I think we are likely to get in and draw our one card here. Again, we've got one of these, like, when you go wide, you draw cards, and I haven't seen a go wide card yet, except for the squirrel card, which I have haven't drawn another fog i think we're gonna bottom that and then draw this card instead not great i mean we've already done a little bit of ramping but you know we slam a nature's lore when it fits so when i you can play it directly from the library you can also um just make a copy of a land is something yeah. i'll do sometimes and you just don't have to do the search trigger especially when it's untapped yeah it doesn't it's a nominal difference to your deck as far as you're likely to draw land from that point on it's like a 0.01 percent difference so mm -hmm. yeah i usually if i'm goldfishing on paper would just take the nature's lore and turn it on its backside and just yeah. pretend it's a force so I don't have to search you. Yeah. Um, we've got a King Herald's Revenge. It's really the only thing we can do with our mana here that's going to do much. The Orin Frostfang, again, feels pretty rough. So... I'm starting to get worried that we're just low on cards here. Yeah. If you're going to play that, be down to three cards, you'll draw four. We're, we're going to draw one here yeah. from Toski, but that does not uh, it's not getting us the card advantage we want. And like playing, paying five mana for this Orin Frostfang is not going to feel good either. So we're drawing a lot of lands. We're going to be like five mana to draw two cards here. Doesn't feel great. So the, there's an interesting thing about Toski where I really, whoop, there's a soul ring hand. I really wanted the deck to kind of be able to do both, yeah. to go wide and go tall because I like the indestructive squirrel joke, but yeah, the deck wants to go wide. Yeah. And I think that is sort of the biggest problem with this deck. This is also sort of funky. We've got a turn one mana dork and we've got a wild growth. Normally you're going to run out your dork first because it yep. doesn't give you mana. Then turn two, you can play a land. You can you know, equip your mana. wild growth. And now you've got two mana here. Nothing. To, oh, you got that in search of greatness. So it keeps show, showing up. It is still here. I guess I have three mana because yeah, I do. have the boreal druid. Yep. Well, this is the only thing we can do with it. Again, these five drops feeling clunky. 
But here's a go wide piece. So maybe this is, is this the moment or do we like we don't have any aura pieces for Toski. I think maybe this is one, two, three, four, five. We get our deep forest hermit down and we finally create some tokens here. Yeah. So and now this whole game plan is different, right? You don't even yeah. necessarily play Toski right away. You can go Sage of Fables, but you can play Toski as well. Yeah. It's, uh, so this has vanishing. You remember you got Scry, so. Yeah. So I don't think I want this Ancestral Mask because I do have the Keeper of Fables and I do have Toski. So I think we're just going to, yeah, I'd rather draw a land. Perfect. Uh, so now we've got a Toski moment. And this is vanishing, so we sort of want to get Toski down while our squirrels are tutus. Yeah. So now we probably have an attack on our uh, on somebody. We can probably get three of our squirrels in. We may lose it, but we're gonna draw three cards. Yeah. I think. I, smash. I think that's fair. We're gonna draw three cards. We're gonna lose a squirrel ish hey we drew another one of our go wide pieces but they feel better in this game they do feel much better because i have the deep forest tournament so it's a uh, it's possible that i should have played the keeper of fables to use my mana a little bit more efficiently because now i have two loose yeah. loose mana um so we've got what one two three four five six seven mana here you're, are you already kind of eyeing that vigor for when that might be deployed yeah what is it so what are is our vanishing on this one vanishing three so this is now down to um one yeah it goes away next turn next turns so we've got one more i th yeah getting vigor down makes these squirrels way bigger getting uh we already have our card draw engine so probably just that yeah, it's efficient with your mana. It allows you to attack with the Druid too, right? Yeah. And so now we can go... We're going to lose this. And l anyway, yeah. Toski has to attack. So now it's really obnoxious to block because uh, they're going to get bigger. So do we expect our opponents to give us five cards? Ooh. You almost don't care. Like, yeah, like <laughs> they block they, a couple, but it doesn't if, matter. If they block here, I don't know, we draw three. Let's say we draw three cards and some of these get counters. So we'll say that these get, there is a way to add power. There we go to all of these. Um, well, I added just power, but you get the idea. Yeah, so now we have a citizen champion, and that is the awkward half of this deck. So you can really feel the two sides of the deck. And I, I knew we were going to feel this, so I wanted to um, show another version of Toski that takes some of the things that we're learning from this goldfishing and applies it. And I'm going to goldfish that. So you're going to see new the new version of the deck so you can see some of the changes. Yeah, because just to be clear, this deck feels like there's the Voltron Toski portion mm. and then there's the Go Wide, you know, Frostfang, Sage of Fables portion. Right. And you either want to go all the way towards one or all the way towards the other because being in the middle feels like it's pretty disjointed. Yeah, now my deck isn't working with itself, right? I've I mean, got... this version felt very strong. I'd say stronger yeah. than the other version. But your original idea for the deck was Voltron Is... Squirrel. Right. That means that's fine. It just probably means pull out you know, Orin, Frostfang, Sage mm -hmm. of Fables. Right. Is that what you're thinking? And you That is exactly what I did. So this is Toski the Ind Indestructive Squirrel. And I, I stuck with the original idea. That was what I was doing. And just with committed Toski. to it. And just committed. Yeah. Like I know that to that this is a less optimized way to build Toski, but this is the way I built it. So let's commit to this bit. I love that as a way to, because when we're goldfishing, I don't think it's necessarily trying to find the most powerful version yeah. Uh, that you can build. We still make our choices like, um, what was the name of the episode we did where we talked about cards that change the power level of your deck? Yeah, yeah. Um, we still fo follow those rules and think about those things, mm. but we just want the deck that we, the, the whatever the log line is for our deck, whatever the reason is we're building it, we want that to work. Right. So she's not making a choice of this is the most powerful version of Toasty. This is the way I wanted to build it, but I want that way to it still- Feel good. Yeah, to still be smooth. Mm. Yeah. So there's some new cards that I could include here too, which is pretty fun. Um. Yeah. So this hand is slow. We've got no ramp. Only this only matters after uh, Toski comes down. So we're gonna mulligan that. Still no ramp. You do have an enchantress, but, but I no do. I do have an <laughs> enchantress. I have an enchantment here. That so this gives you a little bit more plan. It also has a Nykthos in it, yeah. which is pretty good. But again, it does feel slow. I think we're gonna keep this and just see how it goes. This feels reasonable. Turn one, we'll play our land. Turn two, we'll play a land. We're only drawing lands. A little bit concerning. But turn three, we get an Enchantress down. Turn, well, there's a Nature's Lore. Uh, a little awkward now. We're just going to play Toski. Yep. And then next turn, we can cast our Nature's Lore. 
uh, search for a a forest and we can play our ancestral mask and draw a card. So that feels a little bit better. It's slow, but you know, the plan is online now. We can attack with Toski. Toski's a three, three. I'm sure we can get in on somebody this turn. That seems like a pretty good turn for indestructible. Yeah. Yeah. So that feels good. We're going to draw off of that trigger and we draw a keen sense, which is actually a great in this deck. So that was a big change that I made is putting in some of these cheap auras that also draw cards because you're not going to always draw an enchantress. So you need other ways to draw your cards. Uh, because I was finding the same thing when I was gold fishing the other deck is I was running out of cards a lot and you shouldn't be in a, actually we probably play our Nykthos. Uh You shouldn't be in an Enchantress deck. Yeah. So I will play our Keen Sense. We'll play our Keen Sense. We'll draw a magic card. Ooh, we draw a big one. So right now our Nykthos, couple, right? uh just the one from oh, okay. uh, the Enchant Presence. Uh, so how much mana do we have? We can make one, two, three, four, five. Perfect. We can make one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this is four plus the additional two gives yep. us six mana. Oh, this is the seven mana one. Oh, no. no. <laughs> Hang on. We'll pay two mana for the canopy uh, cover. That'll give us a little bit of uh, evasion and draw us another card. Well, we drew some ramp, so I think we're just going to have to play that this turn. This is turn six. Do I have, I have a land drop? Maybe I do still. No, you drop Nykthos. I drop Nykthos. Yeah, that's true. So we'll play this. We'll make another forest. So a little bit clunky, but we'll draw uh, two cards off of Tusky because it is evasive now and it has the keen sense on it. So now we're drawing. We drew another big enchantment to make Tusky huge. A little awkward to have both of those. You really don't want both in your hand, mm-hmm. but here they are. Another cheap aura. That's good. So... We've drawn a lot of lands this game. I think this is the second time that's happened. Uh, and I am on turn seven. You and did land wrap twice too. Yeah. I am on turn seven and I'm not necessarily creating a lethal threat. This turn, it's going to be a big squirrel, but mm, I guess Ancestral Mask is making it pretty big right now. The engine's good, but the path from here is... Is not... It, it looks not like I'll be able to take like a player out, but I don't necessarily have... Ah, Voltron. Uh, yeah, it, that's the thing. <laughs> and and unfortunately, Indestructible does not keep you safe from... Uh, a lot of removal. Yeah. A lot of removal. This hand's a little awkward, but we're going to keep this uh, because it has multiple enchantresses and a way to ramp. So yeah, it seems pretty good. We're, we're going to play a land. We're going to play our, our Gothian enchantress. And then... Oh, thank goodness. Oh, that was great. So now we can play our Fertile Ground, draw a card, and have two mana up to hmm, probably just run out our generous uh, visitor, which is going to put counters on Toski. This is the two mana is not going to do much right now. But uh, here we go. There's four. We didn't draw our land here, which is unfortunate. But here it is. We're going to, I mean, do we just run out the Enchantress's presence and put a keen sense on this. I would maybe draw, draw some cards. two and um, yeah, try and I, get my land drop. Yeah. So I think we're going to run out our second Enchantress here. Yeah, that's actually the one I want. Um, and then we'll cast the keen sense. That'll put a counter on our generous visitor because that's its ability. It's hiding behind this thing, but you get the idea. Uh, we'll draw two cards. No, no lands. lands. Unfortunate. Well, we'll go with our generous visitor. It's a three. It's a two-two. A little dodgy uh, to get an attack through here. But we wouldn't attack if we didn't do it. Did we hit a land? Nope. We're in trouble. There we go. Now we can double spell with Toski. And, uh, well, I should have done it the other yeah, way. We do the three, the three visits first. Then you can cast the Toski. Um, and it, it, you can see how that one got a little clunky. It was a risky keep. We only had the two lands, but we had a, the card advantage where you would hope that we get to lands. So I do like knowing that my deck can sort of scramble. Dig to, its way out of that. To, yeah. yeah. What The worst is when you keep a two lander and your deck doesn't have tools to draw cards when it needs to. Like, mm-hmm. like you, you made some plays in a sequence you wouldn't want to, but in order to draw more cards, but I like to be able to do that when I have to. So Absolutely. I actually see that kind of as a plus. It means that like you do have something that you can lean into to dig out of a problem, right? Yeah. Because decks are going to have problems. This isn't going to prevent you from having 
actual like issues happen. You're not going to draw lands at the right time. You're not going to draw your cards in the right order, but you know that you're prepared to dig out of here. So this game has been actually pretty good. Yeah, I really had good, yeah. a uh, generous visitor on one. I got the wild growth to ramp to get Tusky down a turn early. And now I have five mana and a couple of auras in my hand. So I'm going to have a big squirrel that I can attack with here, yep. which is exactly what this deck wants. And I would already be thinking about the risk cards expertise as like your follow-up play. Mm-hmm. So, because you can, yeah, I have a Rich Card's expertise, so if we can get some power onto yeah. Toski with this Generous Visitor, which is what we're going to do by casting this Utopia Sprawl. Uh, this is a little awkward. No, I do this. I can cast a Keen Sense on Toski, give it another counter. Then I can pay four or three and cast this Cartouche. I can fight something and put another counter on it. And then we're set up next turn because we've got a three, four, four m power squirrel. Is it more than that? Maybe more than that. And you killed something. And I've killed You're something with the fight. Your card. And it has trample set up. So this is great. So now we have two big draw spells. Oh, this is perfect. You drew a five drop. I drew. I drew a five drop, <laughs> and I like have to the play off of your paradise. expertise. So, so we can cast this rich card's expertise. Draw four cards here. Uh, yep. right, it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We have a sweet five drop to cast. We drew another five drop to maybe cast. You cast that one. I don't know. Like maybe we just cast this drain yeah. permit and add the squirrels. So I I did eat, leave in some of the squirrel things because this deck doesn't have a lot of defense. So I did want some some way to create like a wall. Sure, and they are card draw spells kind and they're, of. They're they're flavorful and and card draw spells for Toski. So I did leave those in, and I think in this moment I would absolutely cast the drain permit. Build up a little bit of board. And then you, it's even better for your uh, wild speaker right later. Oh, yeah. The, it gives me... The, I have it, it a return of the wild too. speaker. Which, yeah, it, exactly. This is a return of the wild speaker deck for sure because it has a ton of... Um, it's either big card draw with Toski, or you can overrun with a couple of your squirrel things that I that I did leave in. Yeah, it's it's split up in the way you want. Whereas like a Orion Frostfang or a Sage mm -hmm. of Fables doesn't have the mode of like take advantage of one big creature. Right. And this is turn five, right? So we've this, got a great board. Amazing. We drew some cards. This is exactly what the deck wants to be doing. And it's a little silly, but it's doing something well. And you can tell because there's a lot more synergy going on. So this is a great hand. It's got a turn one elf that I can play out. It's got a turn two uh, set. A, do I want to play the Whisperer or do I want to play a Mana Dork as an interesting, or a uh, Enchantress? Well, you're not going to play an Enchantment next turn, right? You're going to play Toski. I'm going to play Toski. So getting the Sanctum Weaver down just gives you more mana early. Yep. So here we go. We're going to play... Uh, we can play out our Toski. We've got one mana. No, and oh, a one mana enchantment we drew. Sweet. Uh, so now this turn, we wish we drew a little bit more mana here, but we can run out one of our enchantresses and add, what, two green? Yep. Uh, uh, maybe I should have run out the Citizen Champion. Anyway, uh, you get... Plus this one. There we go. That's three. Yep. One, two, three mana. And we can cast our enchant Enchantress's Presence and draw an additional card. There's our land drop. That's what we wanted to see. Now we can draw... Oh my goodness. I clicked the wrong thing. Uh, and we can draw the two cards from our two Enchantresses and attack with Toski. So now we're drawing a ton of cards. We have ways to buff Toski. We even have protection with this Fog spell, and we have two Enchantresses online. This is how the deck really... I tried to make it more of an Enchantress deck, and it'll draw some cards off of Toski incidentally, but mostly it's an Indestructive Squirrel. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you're just trying to be able to make a big Voltron Squirrel, but also not leave yourself completely open to being blown out when your one thing goes away, right? Like, right. So this other engine on the side allows you to still remain sort of safe. Yeah, and it gives you these sort of like early drop pieces that are going to be really important in just maintaining some kind of engine in the deck. And they can still attack and get some... Yeah. That, that's, the I think, the really good thing about one, one drop dorks. Absolutely. Yeah. They get your Toski down a turn earlier, but later you can turn them into card draw. You can train. I, I left in, I think there's two overruns still in the deck because it still will, they'll still pump Toski, which, which does help. But you have all of these cheap creatures like your enchantresses and your mana dorks, and you have some of your more enchant enchantment pieces that like if they get big, they can take somebody out of the game and draw you some cards. Yeah. I mean, even 
like this turn right here, there might be an opponent that just happens to have no blockers and you just get in mm-hmm. for that extra card draw. Yeah, the turn absolutely. you play Toski. You yeah, know, you that's not that's not the main in. reason you play the mana dork, but it is just like you can take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. Did you add a lot of mana dorks from the first? I added a couple. It w- it had three originally, which is like a pretty good number, but if you want to be a mana dork deck, you should really be five six. Yeah, seven, eight even. Uh, so, yeah. So you're so, up towards five six now? Yeah. So yeah, that if feels we go great. back to the deck list, I have upped the creature count significantly. So we've got Arbor Elf and Birds of Paradise, which it doesn't have power, but uh you could there's a lot of yeah. ways to put power on it. Uh, so how many do I have now? I have six now. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I could probably still put more in. I've got a Sakura Tri-Builder, and I still have some of that land ramp. Um, because Tusky's a four drop, I don't mind two mana ramp. Yeah. But could maybe make some space for more two mana dorks because they are so powerful. In yeah, even two mana dorks feel great. And anytime you can say, oh, this dork is a mana, but also has side utility mm-hmm. in the, those instances where, like I said, they just didn't their spells deck or something and they just don't have a, a, a blocker, blocker and yeah it's like cool i'll just draw extra cards thanks. they're not willing to trade you know their their one creature that's on the battlefield yeah yeah so this deck you can feel it working a lot better before we had pieces that were like this is not working with this half of the deck and now it's we understand what's really good these mana dorks feel really really good and we understand that cheap enchantments are going to be the way to churn through the deck yeah, in your um, original build, did you have more like expensive, high impact enchantments? I had I cut one of those out. Um, the the like really expensive enchantments to get on Toski. I also had a couple of like top end to- token things, like an Avenger of Zendikar, that you can just be like, oh, well, the Toski thing isn't working. Slam an Avenger, but. I wanted to focus the deck and cut down on some of the high drops. So I got I cut uh, Pathbreaker Ibex. Uh, it was just an overrun you didn't really need. I cut back on Vigor, yep. which is, again, an overrun that you just don't really need. Um, and I slimmed it down a little bit on the evasion because it had a lot of evasion and not necessarily a lot of like power stuff. And the way that this deck is going to win... Is by hitting someone with a big squirrel. That yeah. is the that is the stated mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> you feel so. like you need an evasion, but then you realize once it's on the battlefield, it's indestructible and huge. And huge. It's you just a, give a trample. <laughs> it's enough of a threat. Like yeah. that that is enough of a problem. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, they're gonna have trouble dealing with that. You don't need these cards that are otherwise dead Absolutely. to make that good. That's good already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I kept a lot of the pieces that are still good from the old build. I think the mutate stuff is really good because it trample. I reprioritize trample and card draw and especially like the keen senses and that kind of thing was a huge add. Take out the high end uh, token makers Mm -hmm. and replace those with some of the mana dorks in the low end yeah. enchantments yeah that made that so just a lot of generally... focus it feels like a focus like yeah absolutely it was like it was like trying to do this and this and now it's like Rrr. yeah we picked a lane and yeah. we're we are fully accepting that this is a this is not a toski tokens deck this is a toski enchantment deck yeah I, I i'm not sure that's something we covered in the early part but that's another really big thing about gold fishing is you can you can have a stated mission for your deck um that's just too much for a deck to really pull mm-hmm. off. And if you try and, I say this all the time, right? right? Mm-hmm. If you try and do A, B, and C, what you're going to do is none of those. Right. So it's usually better to pick A, B, or C because wouldn't you rather just accomplish something rather than nothing? Even though it's like, yeah, I'd love if you could do three different things, but you your deck probably just will have pieces of A and pieces of B and pieces of C and none of it will work together. So you're just better off being like, nope, this deck is A. And I'll build another deck later that's going to be B or C, but... I'm just choosing this because that way I at least get to do A. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, that feels like kind of what this was. Absolutely. And Goldfishing will often tell you that as well, where it's like, oh, these there's these two pieces of the deck. They fight against each other. I just have to choose one. I got to make choices. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, if you start with a very clear choice, you can you can make decisions when Goldfishing. There's specific things that you can pay attention to where it's like, if this is a go wide slash Voltron deck then you're always asking, am I wide enough or am I tall enough? But if you can really focus your energy and be like, I I need to make sure that Toski is getting big enough to be a lethal threat, or I need to make sure that I have enough creatures on board to draw the amount of cards that I want to draw. Um, And that really helps you make a lot of choices when you're goldfishing, but goldfishing will tell you that there's a choice to be made. Yeah, I like the change to Enchantress away from the... Uh, Sage of Fables and Orin Frosting. Those are both card draw pieces. Yeah. But you're like, oh, as I'm doing the growing, I want to be drawing those cards. Right. 
because the other ones were saying, oh, as you're doing the attacking, you're immune to drawing those cards. But mm-hmm. Toski's like already, if I'm attacking, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. So by protect myself better mm-hmm. by as I'm getting to that point, drawing the cards. Right. So uh, you, I changed the the engine to be in service of the plan rather than having a completely side engine that just was doing its best. Um, so yeah, I, you can see that like how the things that I, we learned from gold fishing was was that that or that I learned from gold fishing was that dorks were good, so I put in more. I learned that the enchantresses are good. Let's make them even better. And see if we can find more of them because, you know, there's been more enchantresses that have come out since call time. Yeah, good <laughs> so. point. And also like, oh, these felt bad. Let's get rid yeah. of those. And and yeah. I think those both things are important because if you just come away with things you want to add, it won't. You, then you're like, well, what do I take yeah, out? Yeah, it hasn't solved anything. So, yeah, the, the mm-hmm. big thing is identifying the things that like felt awkward. Yeah. Uh, and and then it's then that's a perfect situation. Yeah, I know what I want to put in and I want to take out. So, yeah. And I took out like five minute draw spells. I took out the Orin Frostfangs and I put in Rishkar's expertise. Yeah. Because now it's like we're drawing cards for making a big thing. We're not drawing cards for having a lot of things. Yeah. And that's a thing that costs the same basically Roughly. as Orin Frostfang or Sage of Fables, mm. but it's going to draw me more cards, right? Right. Because Orin Frostfang, that thing where you play it and you draw one is just a bad situation. Not a plan. But I play this and draw four, put another five drop and play it. That feels great. Now we're much better. Yeah. So. That's uh, those were some big changes that I made because I've been goldfishing Toski for the last week and a half in preparation for this episode, and I was like, "What was I doing? This makes no sense." <laughs> Does that mean you're actually going to update this deck now? I would be really fun to update this list. I I don't have a Voltron deck right now, and Toski is such a funny one because people expect you to go one way, and you're like, "No, no. I refuse." That's very Rachel. Big yeah. squirrel. <laughs> Yeah, I I mean there's a lot of things that we learned. I I that we talked about while we were doing that. I think I was trying to goldfish a little faster than than I normally do, but like knowing how the playtester works on Architect is going to teach you a lot. Like learning that I could lock equipment to creatures means that and like when you just click cards they'll snap into place. All of those things learning cute the hot cur- keys for like new turn or put on the bottom of the library or draw another card um makes gold fishing way faster and it means that you can make these decisions earlier in the process even before you bought any of the cards yeah when so. i cast stuff when i'm regularly gold fishing myself mm-hmm. i don't even tap things yeah i never do yeah i was just doing it for the camera to make sense but yeah. like in general i'm just like that 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 was five okay good i very yeah. rarely yeah when i'm when i'm play testing do i ever actually tap cards you're like it's Playing lands or counting turns. Yep, exactly. Uh, something I didn't draw attention to that I should have in in here is in the playtester. This hand's terrible, but uh, <laughs> you know, they they track the turn that you're on yeah. for you, and I found that to be a really really important tool when I'm playtesting um, is to know exactly where I am in the game and have something that's very clear. So so you're watching your progression go. If you miss land drops, you don't get confused. Yeah, especially when you're playing green and you're putting extra lands in play. It can be confusing. That too, yeah. It's turn six, is it? Is it? Oh, no, it's turn five. I, I played Nature's Lore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, how did I do that? <laughs> uh, yeah, cause it, it, and the reason that is is because it allows you to sort of judge what your board looks like and what your opponent's boards might look like. And mm-hmm. does this... Because it's easy for you to goldfish and kind of lose track of that and be like, this feels good, and then realize, well, yeah, it's turn seven. Yeah. Yeah. Other players might be trying to win the game here. Mm. Is that good enough? You know, depending on your play group or whatever and how powerful things are. And then you can kind of keep it in context knowing like, oh, this is turn five. Generally, I know what board states look on turn five. This looks like a pretty good one. Yeah. Yeah. Or I would feel behind in some games if this was if what this it looks If this is like. all yeah, I had. Yeah. If I've tapped my only blocker and it's turn five, yeah. then you're like, there's a bit of a problem. Yeah. Uh, something we didn't mention but is nice. If you have an interaction in your hand, it's nice to see if you can hold up mana for that interaction in those late games to be like, okay, I can progress my board and hold up my beast within or and hold up my fog or something like that. Um, and make sh- making sure that your late game isn't um, making your interaction feel clunky as well. Yeah. I think it's become more and more important to be able to interact in games a little bit earlier than we're mm-hmm. used to, too. Uh, so, I mean, we have a section here that we're going to talk about how we deal with interaction because I think there are ways to sort of simulate a little bit mm. the interaction in your hand. Again, I don't think you're ever going to get great data on you know how you're interacting yeah. with your opponent's decks because you can't see them. But you can kind of like put some hurdles in place to kind of simulate. Yeah, and a lot of the time, if there's a problem, your removal spell can interrupt it in some way, no matter what removal spell you have. So you're like, if a problem arises, I can remove a piece of it with this with this removal spell. Yeah. 
Um, the one way, and I hadn't used this before, but you put down was to use the planar die. Yeah. So this section, what about interaction is sort of like if people interact with you, because I, I feel like people really get hung up on that when they're yeah, what if they fishing. It's like, what if, what if they remove a thing? What if there's a board wipe? How do I, am I, how am I supposed to know if my deck works? So if, if that's something that you're very hung up on or you know that you're in a highly interactive group, there are, like you can simulate that kind of interaction. And by the planar die thing is interesting because I think it's in a low interaction play group. You can roll a planar die. If it's a blank, then nobody interacts with you. You're good. If it's a chaos, they remove your most powerful permanent. You decide what that is. Uh, your opponents are smart. Your opponents are smart. They remove the most powerful thing. <laughs> uh, and then... Uh, if you hit planeswalk, you need to interact. In yeah, that's way. interesting. Yeah, there's a, a pretty dire threat for you. Right. Yeah. I like that. That actually feels pretty good mm. starting on turn three because you're likely for it to happen, you know, those both of those things happen within the next couple of turns. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I usually will just say something before the, this game, like, okay, on turn four, I need to be able to kill something. So mm. let, how would that go? And what you find is that it doesn't change your your evaluation of your deck that much because if your deck won't work when no one's interacting with it, then it won't work. It won't work at all. Yeah. yeah. If your deck works when no one's interacting with it, then at least it can work. Mm -hmm. And then your question of, but will it work if somebody does interact with it is a little bit... It's further down the line than we're thinking really for this. Yeah, it's just how did they interact exactly? Mm -hmm. What turn did they do it? If your deck can work, then it could work through interaction. But you just, the particulars are too important there to really be able to answer that. And you may mm -hmm. as well just get to, you, then you just deal with those in the moment. Yeah, you just play, play. That's when you're playing the game. You figure out, you're like, all right, I'm soft to board wipes. I need more protection or I need to hold up mana more. That uh, Those are things that you can learn later down the line. What you're trying to get to in gold fishing is just, I have created an engine that is worth interacting with, that my opponents see as a threat that my opponents like have to engage with otherwise and if they don't yeah. I'll win yeah and that's like not easy for a, a lot of decks to create a situation where it's like I am the threat now and goldfishing will get you to that point in, inter like knowing when your opponents interact is just not something that is going to be very easy but if you want to do it roll a planar die see after turn three see what happens and uh, it'll it'll keep you a little bit more spontaneous if that's something that you're worried about in general if your deck can do the thing it feels pretty smooth and gets to the point where we've been getting to where mm. we feel good where it's done a lot the board's pretty big, the plan's online, and my hand's still full. Yeah. Then when they interact... You'll be able to handle it. You can recover because you know your deck from the, the point of having zero mana in hand and seven cards can get there. So mm -hmm. having some mana already and some pieces removed, well, I'm likely to be able to replace some of those pieces. Yeah. Yeah. You can also guess. I mean, if you're at a point where somebody needs to interact or you're going to be a problem, assume they do. Um, especially if it's early in the game, assume somebody interacts, pull that thing off the board. Now what does your deck do? Yeah, be like, oh man, this is awesome. Okay, let's imagine they board wiped, take all the creatures off, and how does it go? Now what? Yeah, a lot of times you go, oh, then I go blah, 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 and I'm right back, you know. Yeah, I, and I'm here. I recover so fast, and it's like, oh, that's great. Yeah, you have to take experience from regular commander games and apply it to your gold fishing. Like, they're not going to let you have Academy Manufacturer for four turns. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll maybe get it for one, and then it'll be gone. Now what? Uh, gold fishing with powerful permanence for indefinite amounts of time is not as helpful, of course. But if you estimate how people respond to certain cards, which you know, you've played these cards in commander before, y you can get an idea for what it looks like in-game. I think it does help you when you're gold fishing too and the sequencing part to think about like, well, what if this got removed? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are cards where when you think in that way, you go, oh, I think I actually would deploy this on the turn that I did this other thing mm -hmm. rather than run it out there and hope I untap with it, right? Yeah. Be realistic about the way that you would play those cards too. Mm -hmm. And that also is, you learn that from gold fishing knowing that like, I really need this for this to work. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I shouldn't make it vulnerable when I don't have to. Because um, there's a tendency in gold fishing to just assume I'm going to untap with everything and then go on there. And I think, you know, at a baseline, that's fine. But a more advanced version of that is being like, I would probably actually play this slightly less good thing to hold this till next turn so I can play it double spell with this other thing. Right. Yeah. And you get their, your value out of it immediately. Yeah. Um, I've also heard people say that they play decks against each other. I wanted to talk about this. This seems insane to me. People bring it up a lot when I talk <laughs> really? about gold fishing. Yeah. 
And I think if that's something that you enjoy doing, you should do it. I don't think it's particularly helpful in gold fishing. Um, I think it just sort of slows down both gold fishing processes and it doesn't give you the kind of information that you really want out of gold fishing, which is not how you respond to your opponents. It's how you build your own plan. Um, also, 1v1 is just not the same as yeah, a I've heard four player game either. So I don't think it actually gives you a good simulation anyway. Mm -hmm. And it just, yeah, it's, it's going to take. I mean, if I've heard of people gold fishing like four uh, architect windows against each other, which yeah. just sounds like it takes a really long time. Yeah, that that to me, I think, is just of such limited value to mm. you. Yeah, really, because also now your um, your thoughts are just spread out and diluted right. among all of these decisions you have to make among all these decks. And mm. like the the strength of gold fishing is th a lot of data really quickly. Yeah, it's that density br that brings certain truths to the forefront because they're repeating they're in your face so much that you can't miss it like every turn four i've got this one extra mana this mm -hmm. has happened five out of the last 10 times si seven out of the last 14 times like mm -hmm. you know it's just in your face and you ha and then you're forced to be like okay what are some one drops that are good you know whereas if you're playing four decks it's so slow and you're paying attention to four decks and nothing stands out to you so right. i just think that that is just not a good way to test yeah it's not it's not my favorite use of of time and I, it's like if it's a fun thing and you want uh, to simulate a commander game then do that but i wouldn't consider that gold fishing exactly be, because it, we are not focusing on the actual deck that you're trying to work on i i've my both my parents are teachers and one thing about teaching versus doing about learning versus doing mm -hmm. and that people get wrong all the time is that they're not supposed to be the same mm -hmm. there's that famous um malcolm gladwell wrote the book uh, Outliers, I think it's an Outliers, mm. which he came up with the 10,000 hour rule that people talk about, which yeah. is this, if you have focused practice of a thing for 10,000 hours, which is usually about 10 years for most mm -hmm. people, then you can reach mastery of that thing. Meaning that you can, you know, make your living probably at it. Not that you're going to be the best musician that ever lived, but you can probably like teach music or be in an orchestra or something mm. like that, um, which is pretty intuitive, right? Like if you do a thing a lot, you'll probably get good at it. But it's yeah. the focus practice part of that that gets missed a lot. It's not just doing it, it's focus practice. If you think of like, I'm a golfer, mm. in order to get good at golf, I don't go play nine rounds of golf all the it's time. It's a lot of walking, it's yeah. walking practice. Yeah, I go to the driving range mm -hmm. and I work on exactly where my wrist is when I hit the ball. And I don't walk around and I'm not playing any holes, I'm just hitting, I'm just driving, I'm just hitting the ball. Or I go to the putting green mm. and I don't worry about how did I, how many, how many shots did it take me to get to this spot on the green or whatever? No, I putt a thousand times yeah. and I work on where are my knees? Where are my shoulders? How are they to the thing? And this is what gold fishing is. You're not yeah. worrying about all of those. out. If I'm playing basketball, I don't worry about what my defender's doing or what the score is or whatever. I'm just, is my wrist cocked that much? And mm. are my knees bent? It's you drills. Know? Yeah, exactly. Focused practice. Mm. It's not just doing the thing. So that's what gold fishing, I think, to to me is. And when people start to say, oh, I play two de decks against each other, or I play four decks all at the same time. They're they're moving away from the pra the drill part of mm -hmm. it, the focus practice part of it. Right. Yeah, and so you can't learn the what you want to learn. It's a different thing. It's mm -hmm. If you're in the arena actually in an MMA fight with somebody, it's not the time to be learning or, or figuring out, right? Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you need the instincts to be right. Right. So yeah. you're training your spine to do something. Yeah. Is like you're, you're establishing habits and learning. Like when you have established habits for a deck, when you're like, I know what I want on two, I know what I want on three. If I'm not there, then I need to pivot so I can get there. All of that makes you a better player it makes your deck just a more functional machine and it takes up less time so it's more considerate of your opponents it gives you you know it just makes you a more refined commander player and I, you know commander's casual but we can still be better at it yeah that's part of the fun of doing anything yeah is being course, better at it's being yeah. better at it. let me tell you i'm really good at eating a cheeseburger yeah Lots of practice. Yeah. Focus to practice. <laughs> oh, yeah. I eat lots of small bites <laughs> of cheeseburger. Oh, yeah. I pay a lot of attention to everybody. <laughs> sliders. A lot of sliders. It's time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about one more thing before we get out of here. Uh, and it's how to goldfish a control deck. Ah. This is a big question that people ask um, about highly interactive decks. You're like, how do I know what to interact with? Yeah. And, uh, of course, it's easiest for proactive decks. But... Uh, I think this is sort of a false question because even highly controlling commander decks have to build some kind of board state. You yep. ha you have to you have to ramp at some point. You have to deploy your commander at some point. You have to set up some kind of plan. Yep. Even if you're interacting, you do have a first five turns that are largely just getting permanence into play. Yep. 
And the trick with control decks is getting those permanents into play in a manner where you still feel in control, like you feel right. safe. And a control deck usually is going to put a higher premium on, did I do this thing, advance, and also be able to interact? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, when I'm, I, I, li- I like control style decks, so mm-hmm. I have a decent amount of them. And when I'm gold fishing those, that's what it's about. Can I get an engine of some kind online where... I still have this one mana and this two mana. And then do I have a one mana and two mana interaction thing most of the time? And then Mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll just be like, okay, I just probably countered something. I just put that in the whatever. Continue. Do I get to do something? And and then later in the game you're looking like, all right, and now will I be able to just be like, okay, cool. I I feel safe at all times basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I get to the point where, you know, I could answer two or three things, you know? Yeah. And, And I can sit here. Answer two or three things. Advance my board state if I need to. I have those all those options available to me. And goldfishing isn't as precise as like I need to answer a creature that's attacking me. It's do I have interaction for something bad that could happen? Yep. It's it's not about like do I die in this moment. It's it, could I do something? It doesn't. I think people really get hung up on like life totals and get really hung up on. Um, your opponent's board state and how they interact with you but the more general you can be the more you can recognize where your deck lies in the grander scheme of things uh, I think the more powerful your deck is going to be overall you could also integrate like a d6 where you you roll a d6 and you know I was if you roll a one you don't need to interact if you roll a two you need to answer a creature if you roll a three you need to answer a a lot of problematic creatures probably a board wipe or something Uh, if you roll a four you need to answer a problematic artifact or enchantment five uh, you need to answer a lot of problematic artifacts and enchantments six you need to answer a problematic instant or sorcery like you could do that if you want to be a highly controlling deck but I don't think that's going to give you as much information as just being like, can I ramp while holding up this interaction I have? If I have spent this interaction, do I have a draw engine online yeah. to continue the game? That's going to be way more important than specific threats. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, it's often just like, oh, I want my deck to be able to play the Rhystic Study and hold up this one song. Mm-hmm. And if I do that, you're very rarely in a game where two interaction spells are pointed at the same target. Mm-hmm. You stop one, you usually get to keep it at least until your upkeep. Yeah. And then I'm upkeep, okay, cool. Can I advance with half my mana and or you know two-thirds of it and keep? Uh, do I have those options available to mm-hmm. me? Yeah. So now I'm like, oh, I get a little more mana on the table and I'm able to still protect stuff. Mm-hmm. And then that's a snowball that like by the time you're on turn six or seven, you're like, cool, now I can just say go. And just blunt everything. And do I have enough stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I feel like. Because if I'm not drawing cards, then I wouldn't, you know, I've deployed things and I only have two things in hand. Well, that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. And you that's play kinda... commander games. You can guess at, like, where in the game you are, where it's like, at this point, there's a scary this. At this point, there's this, this could happen. That's an interesting thing. How do you deal with Rhystic Studies, Mystic Remoras, Esper Sentinels that you play as far as, like, you would draw some cards probably off them? How yeah. do you how do you deal with that when you're gold fishing? I under guess. Yeah. Um, like a like a Jessica's will. Yeah. I always get four mana, uh. so I'm always mana positive, but I don't make like ten. Gotcha. Because you can't you can't right. Like if I draw three cards off my Esper Sentinel, obviously that's great. What if I draw one? Yeah. Um, and usually I'll estimate like I get one yeah. off of it. Um. So those kind of cards are interesting. If you're doing stuff that like when I like I got you play Gonti, I just do it off the top of my deck. Yeah, yeah. And obviously that's going to give you a slightly better thing than what you would normally get, but it, it doesn't matter. It gives you a card. Yeah. Um. So those are like use cases where you, you just come up with the opponent. best approximation. You just guess. approximation you can. And I like what you said there. I err a little on the side of it's worse for me rather than right. it's better because if my deck can still function under the worst case scenario, then it's definitely going to function yeah. under the best case scenario. If I draw yeah. six cards off a risk study. I better be good. Yeah. Uh, if I draw three cards, well, all right, then like, <laughs> right. what can we do with that? <laughs> it's the same thing as like bottoming a soul ring. Yeah. Like, you don't play a mana geyser and make 40 mana because yeah, yeah. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot to do with estimation. It's a lot to do with like, you know, um just being reasonable. Being reasonable. You're like, am I can I get a clean attack with my 2-2 on turn 5? You're like, probably, probably not. not you probably know, not. Probably not. But on turn 2, I think it's fair yeah. to say you probably would. What if it's death touch? Mm, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if they don't know about whatever it is you're trying to yeah. like the thing in hand I'm going to play afterwards which is going to trigger based on the fact that I did combat damage. Yeah. You're way more likely to get in whereas if you have to had 
that out there and they see it, maybe they would block your tutu. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. More art than science in a lot of those cases. For sure. And don't be too hard on yourself and don't worry like, well, it didn't really tell me much because I had to guess it X, Y, and Z. Hmm. Usually it does still tell you the things you need to know. Pay attention to the stuff that we talked about in the beginning of this episode. It, like, if you're goldfishing, honestly, watch the first half of this episode again to be like, what am I looking for? Uh, because that is, the, goldfishing is great for curve and card choices and uh, yeah, sequencing yeah. and, you know, yeah, learning how to pilot the early turns. Yeah. All right. To the listeners, mm-hmm. do you goldfish your decks? Uh, what part of that process do you get the most out of? Is there anything about goldfishing that we didn't cover that you think is yeah. really important? Mm-hmm. Or do you hate goldfishing and just n- not do whatever? That's fair. It'll make you better. You should probably do it. <laughs> yeah. It's also really fun. When I build a new deck and I'm excited to play it, I goldfish a ton. And it makes you even more excited to play you it. You get right? so excited. <laughs> yeah. You're like, look at it go. Look at it go. <laughs> AD good. likes to show me when he's yeah. goldfish. Look what I did. <laughs> like, oh, that's sweet. I have no context for what is happening. <laughs> if you want to pick up any magic cards to improve your magic decks, uh, go to cardkingdom.com slash command. They have a huge selection of magic cards in all of the conditions and the treatments that you're looking for. You can also get sealed product there there's some you can get pre-cons and if you buy it from them you know that they're going to ship it all in one safe package and if something does happen to happen in the process they've got the team to handle it to make sure that your order gets handled appropriately and you'll be taken care of card kingdom super fun especially when you're building a new deck and you've been goldfishing it and you know you have exactly the hundred that you're looking for go to card kingdom uh, to support the show and your new deck cardkingdom.com slash command yeah, and you know another thing we've been saying recently that I think a lot of people don't know is Card Kingdom kind of has the industry standard buy list. Mm. Like most places base their buy list off of Card Kingdom, and they are really good place to sell your cards, and you can do that remotely as well. Mm. I think Murph just recently like went through just his collection, them, yeah. sent like a big box, and you know got a bunch of uh, cash back, and maybe some. You can get store credit as well for uh, more than they'll give you cash for, but you know either one of those options is really good. Um, so and they like receiving cards, and you like getting money for your cards or getting different cards than the cards that mm-hmm. you're sending in. That's my favorite. Yeah, cardkingdom.com slash command. Uh, use their buy list. It's definitely mm-hmm. great. Okay, and of course, once you get those cards, you want to protect them. Ultrapro.com slash command is the best place to go to get your magic accessories. If you want deck boxes, they're going to protect your cards really, really well. In fact, the Satin Towers, uh, these little ones, what are they called? Uh, satin Cubes. Satin Cubes. I love the Satin Cubes. Yeah, I'm in the process of putting most of my decks in from Satin Towers into Satin Cubes just because they save it saves space. Mm-hmm. And so like going to Amsterdam, mm-hmm. you know, going to Vegas, going to Chicago, which we were just at, I can just sort of more compactly. And these things are sturdy. You just know that like your deck is safe. Again, yeah. we're traveling to these events and let's be real, the decks are pretty valuable. Uh, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of, we go to Card Kingdom a lot and there's a lot of cards in there. So, you know, you're going to other countries, mm. on trains and places you don't know, and you got backpacks and suitcases, and just having the peace of mind that you know this product is really going to keep your you know your valuables safe uh, is worth a lot. So ultrapro.com slash command. We use them ourselves. We can't really give any higher endorsement than that. Yeah, and if you use, if I use our affiliate code, it means I'm like. Getting a little money back, kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right? Yeah, you get to support. Oh. Yeah, you're, you're giving a little bit to us when you when you use that affiliate link. Yeah. Uh, it's like extort, just a little extra <laughs> value for every time you cast a spell. I don't know. Not extort. <laughs> you know what I mean? Kicker. It's a kicker cause. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we go, we got to say a big thank you here to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Thank you to Damon Lentz, Eric Lem, Megan Yevker, Rob Galati, Jordan Pridgen, Jamie Block, Arthur Mattercroft, Manson Long, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Evan Limberger, Katie Cole, Mitch Trafford, and Jimmy Wong. All right. And thanks to everybody out there for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>